Book Five, Sections Eleven through Twelve of Politics by Aristotle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leon Meyer. Politics by Aristotle, translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book Five, Sections Eleven through Twelve. Eleven. And they are preserved, to speak generally, by the opposite causes. Or, if we consider them separately, one, royalty is preserved by the limitation of its powers. The more restricted the functions of kings, the longer their power will last unimpaired. For then they are more moderate and not so despotic in their ways, and they are less envied by their subjects. This is the reason why the kingly office has lasted so long among the Molossians and for a similar reason it is continued among the Lacedaemonians, because there it was always divided between two, and afterwards further limited by Theopompus, in various respects, more particularly by the establishment of the Ephiralty. He diminished the power of the kings, but established on a more lasting basis the kingly office, which was thus made in a certain sense not less, but greater. There is a story that, when his wife once asked him, whether he was not ashamed to leave to his sons a royal power which was less than he had inherited from his father, no, indeed, he replied, for the power which I leave to them will be more lasting. As to two, tyrannies, they are preserved in two most opposite ways. One of them is the old traditional method in which most tyrants administer their government. Of such arts, Periander of Corinth is said to have been the great master, and many similar devices may be gathered from the Persians in the administration of their government. There are firstly the prescriptions mentioned some distance back, for the preservation of a tyranny in so far as this is possible, viz. that the tyrant should lop off those who are too high. He must put to death men of spirit. He must not allow common meals, clubs, education, and the like he must be upon his guard against anything which is likely to inspire either courage or confidence among his subjects. He must prohibit literary assemblies or other meetings for discussion, and he must take every means to prevent people from knowing one another, for acquaintance begets mutual confidence. Further, he must compel all persons staying in the city to appear in public and live at his gates. Then he will know what they are doing. If they are always kept under, they will learn to be humble. In short, he should practice these and the like Persian and barbaric arts, which all have the same object. A tyrant should also endeavor to know what each of his subjects says or does, and should employ spies, like the female detectives at Syracuse, and the eavesdroppers, whom Hiero was in the habit of sending to any place of resort or meeting. For the fear of informers prevents people from speaking their minds, and if they do, they are more easily found out. Another art of the tyrant is to sow quarrels among the citizens. Friends should be embroiled with friends, the people with the notables, and the rich with one another. Also, he should impoverish his subjects. He thus provides against the maintenance of a guard by the citizen, and the people, having to keep hard at work, are prevented from conspiring. The pyramids of Egypt afford an example of this policy also the offerings of the family of Sipsilis, and the building of the temple of Olympian Zeus by the Pazistratidae, and the great Polycratean monuments at Samus. All these works were alike intended to occupy the people and keep them poor. Another practice of tyrants is to multiply taxes, after the manner of Dionysius at Syracuse, who contrived that, within five years, his subjects should bring into treasury their whole property. The tyrant is also fond of making war, in order that his subjects may have something to do, and be always in want of a leader. And whereas the power of a king is preserved by his friends, the characteristic of a tyrant is to distrust his friends, because he knows that all men want to overthrow him, and they above all have the power. Again, the evil practices of the last and worst form of democracy are all found in tyrannies. Such is the power given to women in their families, in the hope that they will inform against their husbands, and the license which is allowed to slaves, in order that they may betray their masters. 
for slaves and women do not conspire against tyrants, and they are, of course, friendly to tyrannies and also to democracies, since under them they have a good time. For the people, too, would fain be a monarch, and therefore by them, as well as by the tyrant, the flatterer is held in honor. In democracies he is the demagogue, and the tyrant also has those who associate with him in a humble spirit, which is a work of flattery. Hence tyrants are always fond of bad men, because they love to be flattered, but no man who has the spirit of a free man in him will lower himself by flattery. Good men love others, or at any rate do not flatter them. Moreover, the bad are useful for bad purposes. Nail knocks out nail, as the proverb says. It is characteristic of a tyrant to dislike everyone who has dignity or independence. He wants to be alone in his glory. But anyone who claims a like dignity, or asserts his independence, encroaches upon his prerogative, and is hated by him as an enemy to his power. Another mark of a tyrant is that he likes foreigners better than citizens, and lives with them and invites them to his table. For the one are enemies, but the others enter into no rivalry with him. Such are the notes of the tyrant and the arts by which he preserves his power. There is no wickedness too great for him. All that we have said may be summed up under three heads, which answer to the three aims of the tyrant. These are, one, the humiliation of his subjects. He knows that a mean-spirited man will not conspire against anybody. Two, the creation of mistrust among them, for a tyrant is not overthrown until men begin to have confidence in one another. And this is the reason why tyrants are at war with the good. They are under the idea that their power is endangered by them, not only because they would not be ruled despotically, but also because they are loyal to one another, and to other men, and do not inform against one another or against other men. 3. The tyrant desires that his subjects shall be incapable of action, for no one attempts what is impossible, and they will not attempt to overthrow a tyranny if they are powerless. Under these three heads, the whole policy of a tyrant may be summed up, and to one or other of them all his ideas may be referred. 1. He sows distrust among his subjects. 2. He takes away their power. 3. He humbles them. This, then, is one of the two methods by which tyrannies are preserved, and there is another which proceeds upon an almost opposite principle of action. The nature of this latter method may be gathered from a comparison of the causes which destroy kingdoms. For, as one mode of destroying kingly power is to make the office of king more tyrannical, so the salvation of a tyranny is to make it more like the rule of a king. But of one thing the tyrant must be careful. He must keep power enough to rule over his subjects, whether they like him or not. For if he once gives this up, he gives up his tyranny. But though power must be retained as the foundation, in all else the tyrant should act, or appear to act, in the character of a king. In the first place, he should pretend to care of the public revenues, and not waste money in making presents of a sort at which the common people get excited when they see their hard-won earnings snatched from them, and lavished on courtesans and strangers and artists. He should give an account of what he receives, and of what he spends, a practice which has been adopted by some tyrants, for then he will seem to be a steward of the public rather than a tyrant. Nor need he fear that, while he is lord of the city, he will ever be in want of money. Such a policy is, at all events, much more advantageous for the tyrant when he goes from home than to leave behind him a horde, for then the garrison who remain in the city will be less likely to attack his power and a tyrant, when he is absent from home, has more reason to fear the guardians of his treasure than the citizens, for the one accompany him, but the others remain behind. In the second place, he should be seen to collect taxes, and to require public services only for state purposes, and that he may form a fund in case of war, and generally he ought to make himself the guardian and treasurer of them, as if they belong not to him, but to the public. He should appear not harsh, but dignified, and when men meet him, they should look upon him with reverence, and not with fear. Yet it is hard for him to be respected, if he inspires no respect. And therefore, whatever virtues he may neglect, 
at least he should maintain the character of a great soldier, and produce the impression that he is one. Neither he nor any of his associates should ever be guilty of the least offense against modesty towards the young of either sex who are his subjects, and the women of his family should observe a like self-control towards other women. The insolence of women has ruined many tyrannies. In the indulgence of pleasures, he should be the opposite of our modern tyrants, who not only begin at dawn, and pass whole days in sensuality, but want other men to see them, that they may admire their happy and blessed lot. In these things a tyrant should, if possible, be moderate, or at any rate should not parade his vices to the world. For a drunken and drowsy tyrant is soon despised in attack, not so he who is temperate and wide awake. His conduct should be the very reverse of nearly everything which has been said before about tyrants. He ought to adorn and improve his city, as though he were not a tyrant, but the guardian of the state. Also, he should appear to be particularly earnest in the service of the gods. For if men think that a ruler is religious, and has a reverence for the gods, they are less afraid of suffering injustice at his hands, and they are less disposed to conspire against him, because they believe him to have the very gods fighting on his side. At the same time, his religion must not be thought foolish, and he should honor men of merit, and make them think that they would not be held in more honor by the citizens if they had a free government. The honor he should distribute himself, but the punishment should be inflicted by officers and courts of law. It is a precaution which is taken by all monarchs not to make one person great, but if one, then two or more should be raised, that they may look sharply after one another. If, after all, someone has to be made great, he should not be a man of bold spirit, for such dispositions are ever most inclined to strike. And if anyone is to be deprived of his power, let it be diminished gradually, not taken from him all at once. The tyrant should abstain from all outrage, in particular from personal violence and from wanton conduct towards the young. He should be especially careful of his behavior to men who are lovers of honor, for, as the lovers of money are offended when their property is touched, so are the lovers of honor and the virtuous when their honor is affected. Therefore a tyrant ought either not to commit such acts at all, or he should be thought only to employ fatherly correction, and not to trample upon others. And his acquaintance with youth should be supposed to arise from affection, and not from the insolence of power, and, in general, he should compensate the appearance of dishonor by the increase of honor. Of those who attempt assassination, they are the most dangerous, and require to be most carefully watched, who do not care to survive if they effect their purpose. Therefore, special precautions should be taken about any who think that either they or those for whom they care have been insulted, for when men are led away by passion to assault others, they are regardless of themselves. As Heraclitus says, it is difficult to fight against anger, for a man will buy revenge with his soul. And whereas states consist of two classes, of poor men and of rich, the tyrant should lead both to imagine that they are preserved and prevented from harming one another by his rule, and whichever of the two is stronger, he should attach to his government. For, having this advantage, he has no need either to emancipate slaves, or to disarm the citizens. Either party added to the force which he already has, will make him stronger than his assailants. But enough of these details. What should be the general policy of the tyrant is obvious. He ought to show himself to his subjects in the light not of a tyrant, but of a steward and a king. He should not appropriate what is theirs, but should be their guardian. He should be moderate, not extravagant in his way of life. He should win the notables by companionship, and the multitude by flattery. For then his rule will of necessity be nobler and happier, because he will rule over better men whose spirits are not crushed, over men to whom he himself is not an object of hatred, and of whom he is not afraid. His power, too, will be more lasting. His disposition will be virtuous, or at least half-virtuous, and he will not be wicked, but half-wicked only. 12. Yet no forms of government are so short-lived as oligarchy and tyranny. 
The tyranny which lasted the longest was that of Orthagoras and his sons at Sicyon. This continued for a hundred years. The reason was that they treated their subjects with moderation, and to a great extent observed the laws, and in various ways gained the favor of the people by the care which they took of them. Pleisthenes, in particular, was respected for his military ability. If report may be believed, he crowned the judge who decided against him in the games, and, as some say, the sitting statue in the Agora of Sicyon is the likeness of this person. A similar story is told of Pisistratus, who is said on one occasion to have allowed himself to be summoned and tried before the Areopagus. Next in duration to the tyranny of Orthagoras was that of the Sipsilidae at Corinth, which lasted seventy-three years and six months. Sipsilis reigned thirty years, Periander forty and a half, and Semeticus, the son of Gorgas, three. Their continuance was due to similar causes. Sipsilis was a popular man, who, during the whole time of his rule, never had a bodyguard, and Periander, although he was a tyrant, was a great soldier. Third in duration was the rule of the Pisistratidae at Athens, but it was interrupted, for Pisistratus was twice driven out, so that during three and thirty years he reigned only seventeen, and his sons reigned eighteen altogether thirty-five years. Of other tyrannies, that of Hiero and Gelo at Syracuse was the most lasting. Even this, however, was short, not more than eighteen years in all, for Gelo continued tyrant for seven years, and died in the eighth. Hiero reigned for ten years, and Thrasybulus was driven out in the eleventh month. In fact, tyrannies generally have been of quite short duration. I have now gone through almost all the causes by which constitutional governments and monarchies are either destroyed or preserved. In the Republic of Plato, Socrates treats of revolutions, but not well, for he mentions no cause of change which peculiarly affects the first, or perfect state. He only says that the cause is that nothing is abiding, but all things change in a certain cycle, and that the origin of the change consists in those numbers of which four and three married with five furnish two harmonies. He means when the number of this figure becomes solid. He conceives that nature, at certain times, produces bad men, who will not submit to education, in which latter particular he may very likely be not far wrong, for there may well be some men who cannot be educated and made virtuous. But why is such a cause of change peculiar to his ideal state, and not rather common to all states, nay to everything which comes into being at all? And is it by the agency of time, which, as he declares, makes all things change, that things which did not begin together change together? For example, if something has come into being the day before the completion of the cycle, will it change with things that came into being before? Further, why should the perfect state change into the Spartan? For governments more often take an opposite form than one akin to them. The same remark is applicable to the other changes. He says that the Spartan constitution changes into an oligarchy, and this into a democracy, and this again into a tyranny and yet the contrary happens quite as often, for a democracy is even more likely to change into an oligarchy than into a monarchy. Further, he never says whether tyranny is or is not liable to revolutions, and if it is, what is the cause of them, or into what form it changes. And the reason is that he could not very well have told, for there is no rule. According to him, it should revert to the first and best, and then there would be a complete cycle. But, in point of fact, a tyranny often changes into a tyranny, as that at Sicyon changed from the tyranny of Myron into that of Cleisthenes, into oligarchy, as the tyranny of Antillion did at Chalcis, into democracy, as that of Gelo's family did at Syracuse, into aristocracy, as at Carthage, and the tyranny of Carleus at Lacedaemon. Often an oligarchy changes into a tyranny, like most of the ancient oligarchies in Sicily. For example, the oligarchy at Leontini changed into the tyranny of Panetius, that at Gila into the tyranny of Cleander, that at Regium into the tyranny of Anaxilaeus. The same thing has happened in many other states. And it is absurd to suppose 
that the state changes into an oligarchy merely because the ruling class are lovers and makers of money, and not because the very rich think it unfair that the very poor should have an equal share in the government with themselves. Moreover, in many oligarchies there are laws against making money and trade, but at Carthage, which is a democracy, there is no such prohibition, and yet to this day the Carthaginians have never had a revolution. It is absurd, too, for him to say that an oligarchy is two cities, one of the rich and the other of the poor. Is not this just as much the case in the Spartan constitution, or in any other, in which either all do not possess equal property, or all are not equally good men? Nobody need be poorer than he was before, and yet the oligarchy may change all the same into a democracy, if the poor form the majority, and a democracy may change into an oligarchy, if the wealthy class are stronger than the people, and the one are energetic, the other indifferent. Once more, although the causes of the change are very numerous, he mentions only one, which is that the citizens become poor through dissipation and debt, as though he thought that all, or the majority of them, were originally rich. This is not true, though it is true that when any of the leaders lose their property, they are ripe for revolution. But when anybody else, it is no great matter, and an oligarchy does not even then more often pass into a democracy than into any other form of government. Again, if men are deprived of the honors of state, and are wronged and insulted, they make revolutions, and change forms of government, even although they have not wasted their substance because they might do what they liked, of which extravagance he declares excessive freedom to be the cause. Finally, although there are many forms of oligarchies and democracies, Socrates speaks of their revolutions as though there were only one form of either of them. End of Book 5, Sections 11-12 through 12. Book 6, Sections 1-4 through 4 of Politics by Aristotle This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leon Meyer Politics by Aristotle Translated by Benjamin Jowett Book 6 Section 1 We have now considered the varieties of the deliberative or supreme power in states, and the various arrangements of law courts and state offices, and which of them are adapted to different forms of government. We have also spoken of the destruction and preservation of constitutions, how and from what causes they arise. Of democracy and all other forms of government there are many kinds, and it will be well to assign to them severally the modes of organization which are proper and advantageous to each, adding what remains to be said about them. Moreover, we ought to consider the various combinations of these modes themselves, for such combinations make constitutions overlap one another, so that aristocracies have an oligarchical character, and constitutional governments incline to democracies. When I speak of the combinations which remain to be considered, and thus far have not been considered by us, I mean such as these. When the deliberative part of the government, and the election of officers, is constituted oligarchically, and the law courts aristocratically, or when the courts and the deliberative part of the state are oligarchical, and the election to office aristocratical, or when, in any other way, there is a want of harmony in the composition of a state. I have shown already what forms of democracy are suited to particular cities, and what of oligarchy to particular peoples, and to whom each of the other forms of government is suited. Further, we must not only show which of these governments is the best for each state, but also briefly proceed to consider how these and other forms of government are to be established. First of all, let us speak of democracy, which will also bring to light the opposite form of government, commonly called oligarchy. For the purposes of this inquiry, we need to ascertain all the elements and characteristics of democracy, since from the combinations of these, the varieties of democratic government arise. There are several of these differing from each other, and the difference is due to two causes. One has already been mentioned, differences of population 
for the popular element may consist of husbandmen, or of mechanics, or of laborers, and if the first of these be added to the second, or the third to the two others, not only does the democracy become better or worse, but its very nature is changed. A second cause remains to be mentioned. The various properties and characteristics of democracy, when variously combined, make a difference. For one democracy will have less, and another will have more, and another will have all of these characteristics. There is an advantage in knowing them all, whether a man wishes to establish some new form of democracy, or only to remodel an existing one. Founders of state try to bring together all the elements which accord with the ideas of the several constitutions, but this is a mistake of theirs, as I have already remarked when speaking of the destruction and preservation of states. We will now set forth the principles, characteristics, and aims of such states. Section 2 the basis of a democratic state is liberty, which, according to the common opinion of men, can only be enjoyed in such a state. This they affirm to be the great end of every democracy. One principle of liberty is for all to rule and be ruled in turn, and, indeed, democratic justice is the application of numerical, not proportionate equality. Whence it follows that the majority must be supreme, and that whatever the majority approve must be the end and the just. Every citizen, it is said, must have equality, and therefore in a democracy the poor have more power than the rich, because there are more of them, and the will of the majority is supreme. This, then, is one note of liberty which all Democrats affirm to be the principle of their state. Another is that a man should live as he likes, this, they say, is the privilege of a free man, since, on the other hand, not to live as a man likes is the mark of a slave. This is the second characteristic of democracy, whence has arisen the claim of men to be ruled by none, if possible, or, if this is impossible, to rule and be ruled in turns, and so it contributes to the freedom based upon equality. Such being our foundation, and such the principle from which we start, the characteristics of democracy are as follows the election of officers by all out of all, and that all should rule over each, and each in his turn over all, that the appointment to all offices, or to all but those which require experience and skill, should be made by lot, that no property qualification should be required for offices, or only a very low one, that a man should not hold the same office twice, or not often, or in the case of a few except military offices, that the tenure of all offices, or of as many as possible, should be brief, that all men should sit in judgment, or that judges selected out of all should judge in all matters, or in most, and in the greatest and most important, such as the scrutiny of accounts, the constitution, and private contracts, that the assembly should be supreme over all causes, or at any rate over the most important, and the magistrates over none, or only over a very few. Of all magistracies, a council is the most democratic when there is not the means of paying all the citizens, but when they are paid, even this is robbed of its power, for the people then draw all cases to themselves, as I said in the previous discussion. The next characteristic of democracy is payment for services. Assembly, law courts, magistrates, Everybody receives pay, when it is to be had, or when it is not to be had for all, then it is given to the law courts and to the stated assemblies, to the council and to the magistrates, or at least to any of them who are compelled to have their meals together. And whereas oligarchy is characterized by birth, wealth, and education, the notes of democracy appear to be the opposite of these, low birth, poverty, mean employment. Another note is that no magistracy is perpetual, but if any such have survived some ancient change in the Constitution, it should be stripped of its power, and the holder should be elected by lot and no longer by vote. These are the points common to all democracies, but democracy and demos, in their truest form, are based upon the recognized principle of democratic justice, that all should count equally for equality implies that the poor should have no more share in the government than the rich, 
and should not be the only rulers, but that all should rule equally according to their numbers. And in this way, men think that they will secure equality and freedom in their state. Section 3 Next comes the question, how is this equality to be obtained? Are we to assign to a thousand poor men the property qualifications of five hundred rich men? And shall we give the thousand a power equal to that of the five hundred? Or, if this is not to be the mode, ought we, still retaining the same ratio, to take equal numbers from each, and give them the control of the elections and of the courts? Which, according to the democratical notion, is the juster form of the Constitution, this or one based on numbers only? Democrats say that justice is that to which the majority agree, oligarchs that to which the wealthier class. In their opinion, the decision should be given according to the amount of property. In both principles there is some inequality and injustice. For if justice is the will of the few, any one person who has more wealth than all the rest of the rich put together ought, upon the oligarchical principle, to have the sole power. But this would be tyranny. Or, if justice is the will of the majority, as I was before saying, they will unjustly confiscate the property of the wealthy minority. To find a principle of equality which they both agree, we must inquire into their respective ideas of justice. Now, they agree in saying that whatever is decided by the majority of the citizens is to be deemed law. Granted, but not without some reserve, since there are two classes out of which a state is composed, the poor and the rich, that is to be deemed law, on which both or the greater part of both agree. And if they disagree, that which is approved by the greater number, and by those that have the higher qualification. For example, suppose that there are ten rich and twenty poor, and some measure is approved by six of the rich, and is disapproved by fifteen of the poor and the remaining four of the rich join with the party of the poor, and the remaining five of the poor with that of the rich. In such a case, the will of those whose qualifications, when both sides are added up, are the greatest, should prevail. If they turn out to be equal, there is no greater difficulty than at present, when, if the assembly or the courts are divided, recourse is had to the lot, or to some similar expedient. But although it may be difficult in theory to know what is just and equal, the practical difficulty of inducing those to forbear, who can, if they like, encroach, is far greater, for the weaker are always asking for equality and justice, but the stronger care for none of these things. Section 4 Of the four kinds of democracy, as was said in the previous discussion, the best is that which comes first in order. It is also the oldest of them all. I am speaking of them according to the natural classification of their inhabitants. For the best material of democracy is an agricultural population. There is no difficulty in forming a democracy where the mass of the people live by agriculture or tending of cattle. Being poor, they have no leisure, and therefore do not often attend the assembly and, not having the necessaries of life, they are always at work, and do not covet the property of others. Indeed, they find their employment pleasanter than the cares of government, or office, where no great gains can be made out of them, for the many are more desirous of gain than of honor. A proof is that even the ancient tyrannies were patiently endured by them, as they still endure oligarchies, if they are allowed to work and are not deprived of their property, for some of them grow quickly rich, and the others are well enough off. Moreover, they have the power of electing the magistrates and calling them to account. Their ambition, if they have any, is thus satisfied, and in some democracies, although they do not all share in the appointment of offices, except the representatives elected in turn out of the whole people, as at Mantinea, yet if they have the power of deliberating, the many are contented. Even this form of government may be regarded as a democracy, and was such at Mantinea. Hence it is both expedient and customary, in the aforementioned type of democracy, that all should elect to offices, and conduct scrutinies, and sit in the law courts, 
but that the great offices should be filled up by election and from persons having a qualification, the greater requiring a greater qualification, or if there be no offices for which a qualification is required, then those who are marked out by special ability should be appointed. Under such a form of government, the citizens are sure to be governed well, for the offices will always be held by the best persons, the people are willing enough to elect them, and are not jealous of the good. The good and the notables will then be satisfied, for they will not be governed by men who are their inferiors, and the persons elected will rule justly, because others will call them to account. Every man should be responsible to others, nor should anyone be allowed to do just as he pleases. For, where absolute freedom is allowed, there is nothing to restrain the evil which is inherent in every man. But the principle of responsibility secures that which is the greatest good in states. The right persons rule, and are prevented from doing wrong, and the people have their due. It is evident that this is the best kind of democracy. And why? Because the people are drawn from a certain class. Some of the ancient laws of most states were, all of them, useful with a view to making the people husbandmen. They provided either that no one should possess more than a certain quantity of land, or that, if he did, the land should not be within a certain distance from the town or the acropolis. Formerly, in many states, there was a law forbidding anyone to sell his original allotment of land. There is a similar law attributed to Oxylus, which is to the effect that there should be a certain portion of every man's land on which he could not borrow money. A useful corrective to the evil of which I am speaking would be the law of the Ephitians, who, although they are numerous, and do not possess much land, are all of them husbandmen. For their properties are reckoned in the census, not entire, but only in such small portions that even the poor may have more than the amount required. Next best to an agricultural, and in many respects similar, are a pastoral people, who live by their flocks. They are the best trained of any for war, robust in body and able to camp out. The people of whom other democracies consist are far inferior to them, for their life is inferior. There is no room for moral excellence in any of their employments, whether they be mechanics or traders or laborers. Besides, people of this class can readily come to the assembly, because they are continually moving about in the city and in the agora, whereas husbandmen are scattered over the country, and do not meet, or equally feel the want of assembling together. Where the territory also happens to extend to a distance from the city, there is no difficulty in making an excellent democracy or constitutional government, for the people are compelled to settle in the country and even if there is a town population, the assembly ought not to meet in democracies when the country people cannot come. We have thus explained how the first and best form of democracy should be constituted. It is clear that the other or inferior sorts will deviate in a regular order, and the population which is excluded will at each stage be of a lower kind. The last form of democracy, that in which all share alike, is one which cannot be borne by all states, and will not last long unless well regulated by laws and customs. The more general causes which tend to destroy this or other kinds of government have been pretty fully considered. In order to constitute such a democracy and strengthen the people, the leaders have been in the habit including as many as they can, and making citizens not only of those who are legitimate, but even of the illegitimate, and of those who have only one parent a citizen, whether father or mother. For nothing of this sort comes amiss to such a democracy. This is the way in which demagogues proceed. Whereas the right thing would be to make no more additions when the number of the commonality exceeds that of the notables and of the middle class, beyond this not to go. When in excess of this point, the constitution becomes disorderly, and the notables grow excited and impatient of the democracy, as in the insurrection at Cyrene. For no notice is taken of a little evil, but when it increases it strikes the eye. Measures like those which Cleisthenes passed when he wanted to increase the power of the democracy at Athens, 
or such as were taken by the founders of popular government at Cyrene, are useful in the extreme form of democracy. Fresh tribes and brotherhoods should be established. The private rights of families should be restricted, and converted into public ones. In short, every contrivance should be adopted which will mingle the citizens with one another, and get rid of old connections. Again, the measures which are taken by tyrants appear, all of them, to be democratic, such, for instance, as the license permitted to slaves, which may be to a certain extent advantageous, and also that of women and children, and the afflowing everybody to live as he likes. Such a government will have many supporters, for most persons would rather live in a disorderly than in a sober manner. End of Book 6, Sections 1-4 through four. Book Six, Sections Five through Eight of Politics by Aristotle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leon Meyer. Politics by Aristotle. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book Six, Section Five. The mere establishment of a democracy is not the only or principal business of the legislator, or of those who wish to create such a state, for any state, however badly constituted, may last one, two, or three days. A far greater difficulty is the preservation of it. The legislator should, therefore, endeavor to have a firm foundation according to the principles already laid down concerning the preservation and destruction of states. He should guard against the destructive elements, and should make laws, whether written or unwritten, which will contain all the preservatives of states. He must not think the truly democratical or oligarchical measure to be that which will give the greatest amount of democracy or oligarchy, but that which will make them last longest. The demagogues of our own day often get property confiscated in the law courts in order to please the people but those who have the welfare of the state at heart should counteract them, and make a law that the property of the condemned should not be public and go into the treasury, but be sacred. Thus offenders will be as much afraid, for they will be punished all the same, and the people, having nothing to gain, will not be so ready to condemn the accused. Care should also be taken that state trials are as few as possible, and heavy penalties should be inflicted on those who bring groundless accusations, for it is the practice to indict not members of the popular party, but the notables, although the citizens ought to be all attached to the Constitution as well, or at any rate should not regard their rulers as enemies. Now, since in the last and worst form of democracy the citizens are very numerous, and can hardly be made to assemble unless they are paid, and to pay them where there are no revenues, presses hardly upon the notables, for the money must be obtained by a property tax, and confiscations and corrupt practices of the courts, things which have before now overthrown many democracies. Where, I say, there are no revenues, the government should hold few assemblies, and the law court should consist of many persons, but sit for a few days only. This system has two advantages— First, the rich do not fear the expense, even although they are unpaid themselves when the poor are paid. And secondly, causes are better tried, for wealthy persons, although they do not like to be long absent from their own affairs, do not mind going for a few days to the law courts. Where there are revenues, the demagogues should not be allowed after their manner to distribute the surplus. The poor are always receiving and always wanting more and more for such help is like water poured into a leaky cask. Yet the true friend of the people should see that they be not too poor, for extreme poverty lowers the character of the democracy. Measures, therefore, should be taken which will give them lasting prosperity, and as this is equally the interest of all classes, the proceeds of the public revenues should be accumulated and distributed among its poor, if possible, in such quantities as may enable them to purchase a little farm, or at any rate make a beginning in trade or husbandry. 
and if this benevolence cannot be extended to all, money should be distributed in turn according to tribes or other divisions, and in the meantime the rich should pay the fee for the attendance of the poor at the necessary assemblies, and should in return be excused from useless public services. By administering the state in this spirit, the Carthaginians retain the affections of the people. Their policy is, from time to time, to send some of them into their dependent towns, where they grow rich. It is also worthy of a generous and sensible nobility to divide the poor amongst them, and give them the means of going to work. The example of the people of Tarentum is also well deserving of imitation. For, by sharing the use of their own property with the poor, they gain their good will. Moreover, they divide all their offices into two classes, some of them being elected by vote, the others by lot. The latter, that the people may participate in them, and the former, that the state may be better administered. A like result may be gained by dividing the same offices, so as to have two classes of magistrates, one chosen by vote, the other by lot. Enough has been said of the manner in which democracies ought to be constituted. Section 6 From these considerations, there will be no difficulty in seeing what should be the constitution of oligarchies. We have only to reason from opposites and compare each form of oligarchy with the corresponding form of democracy. The first and best attempered of oligarchies is akin to a constitutional government. In this there ought to be two standards of qualification, the one high, the other low, the lower qualifying for the humbler yet indispensable offices, and the higher for the superior ones. He who acquires the prescribed qualification should have the rights of citizenship. The number of those admitted should be such as will make the entire governing body stronger than those who are excluded, and the new citizen should always be taken out of the better class of the people. The principle, narrowed a little, gives another form of oligarchy, until at length we reach the most cliquish and tyrannical of them all, answering to the extreme democracy, which, being the worst, requires vigilance in proportion to its badness. For, as healthy bodies and ships, well provided with sailors, may undergo many mishaps and survive them, whereas sickly constitutions and rotten, ill-manned ships are ruined by the very least mistake, so do the worst forms of government require the greatest care. The populousness of democracies generally preserves them, for the state need not be much increased, since there is no necessity that number is to democracy in the place of justice based on proportion. Whereas the preservation of an oligarchy clearly depends on an opposite principle, viz. good order. Section 7 As there are four chief divisions of the common people, husbandmen, mechanics, retail traders, laborers, so also there are four kinds of military forces, the cavalry, the heavy infantry, the light-armed troops, the navy. When the country is adapted for cavalry, then a strong oligarchy is likely to be established for the security of the inhabitants depends upon a force of this sort, and only rich men can afford to keep horses. The second form of oligarchy prevails when the country is adapted to heavy infantry, for this service is better suited to the rich than to the poor. But the light-armed and the naval element are wholly democratic, and nowadays, where they are numerous, if the two parties quarrel, the oligarchy are often worsted by them in the struggle. A remedy for this state of things may be found in the practice of generals, who combine a proper contingent of light-armed troops with cavalry and heavy-armed. And this is the way in which the poor get the better of the rich in civil contests. Being lightly armed, they fight with advantage against cavalry and heavy infantry. An oligarchy which raises such a force out of the lower classes raises a power against itself. And therefore, since the ages of the citizens vary, and some are older and some younger, the fathers should have their own sons, while they are still young, taught the agile movements of light-armed troops. And these, when they have been taken out of the ranks of the youth, should become light-armed warriors in reality. 
the oligarchy should also yield a share in the government to the people, either, as I said before, to those who have a property qualification, or, as in the case of Thebes, to those who have abstained for a certain number of years from mean employments, or, as at Massalia, to men of merit who are selected for their worthiness, whether previously citizens or not. The magistracies of the highest rank, which ought to be in the hands of the governing body, should have expensive duties attached to them, and then the people will not desire them, and will take no offense at the privileges of their rulers, when they see that they pay a heavy fine for their dignity. It is fitting also that the magistrates, on entering office, should offer magnificent sacrifices or erect some public edifice. And then, the people who participate in the entertainments, and see the city decorated with votive offerings and buildings, will not desire an alteration in the government, and the notables will have memorials of their munificence. This, however, is anything but the fashion of our modern oligarchs, who are as covetous of gain as they are of honor. Oligarchies like theirs may well be described as petty democracies. Enough of the manner in which democracies and oligarchies should be organized. Section 8 Next in order follows the right distribution of offices, their number, their nature, their duties, of which indeed we have already spoken. No state can exist not having the necessary offices, and no state can be well administered not having the offices which tend to preserve harmony and good order. In small states, as we have already remarked, there must not be many of them, but in larger there must be a larger number, and we should carefully consider which offices may properly be united and which separated. First among necessary offices is that which has the care of the market. A magistrate should be appointed to inspect contracts and to maintain order. For in every state there must inevitably be buyers and sellers who will supply one another's wants. This is the readiest way to make a state self-sufficing and so fulfill the purpose for which men come together into one state. A second office of a similar kind undertakes the supervision and embellishment of public and private buildings, the maintaining and repairing of houses and roads, the prevention of disputes about boundaries, and other concerns of a like nature. This is commonly called the office of city warden, and has various departments, which in more populous towns are shared among different persons, one, for example, taking charge of the walls, another of the fountains, a third of harbors. There is another equally necessary office, and of a similar kind, having to do with the same matters without the walls and in the country. The magistrates who hold this office are called wardens of the country, or inspectors of the woods. Besides these three, there is a fourth office of receivers of taxes, who have under their charge the revenue which is distributed among the various departments. These are called receivers or treasurers. Another officer registers all private contracts and decisions of the courts, all public indictments, and also all preliminary proceedings. This office again is sometimes subdivided, in which case one officer is appointed over all the rest. These officers are called recorders, or sacred recorders, presidents, and the like. Next to these comes an office of which the duties are the most necessary and also the most difficult, viz. that to which is committed the execution of punishments, or the exaction of fines from those who are posted up according to the registers, and also the custody of prisoners. The difficulty of this office arises out of the odium which is attached to it, no one will undertake it unless great profits are made, and anyone who does is loath to execute the law. Still, the office is necessary, for judicial decisions are useless if they take no effect, and if society cannot exist without them, neither can it exist without the execution of them. It is an office which, being so unpopular, should not be entrusted to one person, but divided among several taken from different courts. In like manner, an effort should be made to distribute among different persons the writing up of those who are on register of public debtors. Some sentences should be executed by the magistrates also, and in particular penalties due to the outgoing, magistrates should be exacted by the incoming ones, 
and as regards those due to magistrates already in office, when one court has given judgment, another should exact the penalty. For example, the wardens of the city should exact the fines imposed by the wardens of the agora, and others again should exact the fines imposed by them. For penalties are more likely to be exacted when less odium attaches to the exaction of them. But a double odium is incurred when the judges who have passed also execute the sentence, and if they are always the executioners, they will be the enemies of all. In many places, while one magistracy executes the sentence, another has the custody of the prisoners, as, for example, the eleven at Athens. It is well to separate off the jailership also, and try by some device to render the office less unpopular. For it is quite as necessary as that of the executioners, but good men do all they can to avoid it, and worthless persons cannot safely be trusted with it for they themselves require a guard, and are not fit to guard others. There ought not, therefore, to be a single or permanent officer set apart for this duty, but it should be entrusted to the young, wherever they are organized into a band or guard, and different magistrates acting in turn should take charge of it. These are the indispensable officers, and should be ranked first. Next in order follow others, equally necessary but of higher rank, in requiring great experience and fidelity. Such are the officers to which are committed the guard of the city, and other military functions. Not only in time of war, but of peace, their duty will be to defend the walls and gates, and to muster and marshal the citizens. In some states there are many such offices, in others there are a few only, while small states are content with one. These officers are called generals or commanders. Again, if a state has cavalry or light-armed troops or archers or a naval force, it will sometimes happen that each of these departments has separate officers, who are called admirals or generals of cavalry or of light-armed troops. And there are subordinate officers called naval captains and captains of light-armed troops and of horse, having others under them. All these are included in the department of war. Thus much of military command. But since many, not to say all, of these offices handle the public money, there must of necessity be another office which examines and audits them, and has no other functions. Such officers are called by various names, scrutineers, auditors, accountants, controllers. Besides all these offices, there is another which is supreme over them, and to this it is often entrusted both the introduction and the ratification of measures or at all events it presides in a democracy over the assembly. For there must be a body which convenes the supreme authority in the state. In some places they are called probuli, because they hold previous deliberations, but in a democracy more commonly counselors. These are the chief political offices. Another set of officers is concerned with the maintenance of religion. Priests and guardians see to the preservation and repair of the temples of the gods and to other matters of religion. One office of this sort may be enough in small places, but in larger ones there are a great many besides the priesthood. For example, superintendents of public worship, guardians of shrines, treasurers of the sacred revenues. Nearly connected with these, there are also the officers appointed for the performance of the public sacrifices, except any which the law assigns to the priests. Such sacrifices derive their dignity from the public hearth of the city. They are sometimes called archons, sometimes kings, and sometimes prytanies. These, then, are the necessary offices, which may be summed up as follows. Offices concerned with matters of religion, with war, with the revenue and expenditure, with the market, with the city, with the harbors, with the country, also with the courts of law, with the records of contracts, with execution of sentences, with custody of prisoners, with audits and scrutinies and accounts of magistrates. Lastly, there are those which preside over the public deliberations of the state. There are, likewise, magistracies characteristic of states which are peaceful and prosperous, and at the same time have a regard to good order, such as the offices of guardians of women, 
guardians of the law, guardians of children, and directors of gymnastics, also superintendents of gymnastic and Dionysiac contests, and of other similar spectacles. Some of these are clearly not democratic offices, for example, the guardianships of women and children. The poor, not having any slaves, must employ both their women and children as servants. Once more, there are three offices according to whose directions the highest magistrates are chosen in certain states. Guardians of the law, probuli, counselors. Of these, the guardians of the law are an aristocratical, the probuli an oligarchical, the council a democratical institution enough of the different kinds of offices end of book 6 sections 5 through 8book 7 sections 1 through 3 of politics by aristotle this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org Politics by Aristotle, translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book seven, sections one through three. Book seven, one. He who would duly inquire about the best form of a state ought first to determine which is the most eligible life. While this remains uncertain, the best form of the state must also be uncertain, for in the natural order of things those may be expected to lead the best life who are governed in the best manner of which their circumstances admit. We ought, therefore, to ascertain, first of all, which is the most generally eligible life, and then whether the same life is or is not the best for the state and for individuals. Assuming that enough has already been said in discussions outside the school concerning the best life, we will now only repeat what is contained in them. Certainly no one will dispute the propriety of that partition of goods which separates them into three classes, viz., external goods, goods of the body, and goods of the soul, or deny that the happy man must have all three. For no one would maintain that he is happy who has not in him a particle of courage, or temperance, or justice, or prudence, who is afraid of every insect which flutters past him, and who will commit any crime, however great, in order to gratify his lust of meat or drink, who will sacrifice his dearest friend for the sake of half a farthing, and is as feeble and false in mind as a child or a madman. These propositions are almost universally acknowledged as soon as they are uttered, but men differ about the degree or relative superiority of this or that good. Some think that a very moderate amount of virtue is enough, but set no limit to their desires of wealth, property, power, reputation, and the like. To whom we reply by an appeal to facts, which easily prove that mankind do not acquire or preserve virtue by the help of external goods, but external goods by the help of virtue, and that happiness, whether consisting in pleasure or virtue, or both, is more often happy with those who are most highly cultivated in their mind, and in their character, and have only a moderate share of external goods, than among those who possess external goods to a useful extent, but are deficient in higher qualities. And this is not only a matter of experience, but if reflected upon, will easily appear to be in accordance with reason. For, whereas external goods have a limit, like any other instrument, and all things useful are of such a nature, that where there is too much of them they must either do harm, or at any rate, to be of no use, to their possessors, every good of the soul, the greater it is, is also of greater use, if the epithet useful as well as noble is appropriate to such subjects. No proof is required to show that the best state of one thing in relation to another corresponds in degree of excellence to the interval between the natures of which we say that these very states are states, so that, if the soul is more noble than our possessions or our bodies, both absolutely and in relation to us, it must be admitted that the best state of either has a similar ratio to the other. Again, it is for the sake of the soul that goods external and goods of the body are eligible at all, and all wise men ought to choose them for the sake of the soul, and not the soul for the sake of them. 
Let us acknowledge, then, that each one has just so much of happiness as he has of virtue and wisdom, and of virtuous and wise action. God is a witness to us of this truth, for he is happy and blessed, not by reason of any external good, but in himself and by reason of his own nature. And herein of necessity lies the difference between good fortune and happiness, for external goods come of themselves, and chance is the author of them, but no one is just or temperate by or through chance. In like manner, and by a similar train of argument, the happy state may be shown to be that which is best and which acts rightly, and rightly it cannot act without doing right actions, and neither individual nor state can do right actions without virtue and wisdom. Thus the courage, justice, and wisdom of a state have the same form and nature as the qualities which give the individual who possesses them the name of just, wise, or temperate. Thus much may suffice by way of preface, for I could not avoid touching upon these questions, neither could I go through all the arguments affecting them. These are the business of another science. Let us assume, then, that the best life, both for individuals and states, is the life of virtue, when virtue has external goods enough for the performance of good actions. If there are any who controvert our assertion, we will in this treatise pass them over, and consider their objections hereafter. 2. There remains to be discussed the question whether the happiness of the individual is the same as that of the state, or different. Here again there can be no doubt. No one denies that they are the same. For those who hold that the well-being of the individual consists in his wealth, also think that riches make the happiness of the whole state. And those who value most highly the life of a tyrant deem that city the happiest which rules over the greatest number while they who approve an individual for his virtue say that the more virtuous a city is, the happier it is. Two points here present themselves for consideration. First, which is the more eligible life, that of a citizen who is a member of a state, or that of an alien who has no political ties? And again, too, which is the best form of constitution, or the best condition of a state, either on the supposition that political privileges are desirable for all, or for majority only. Since the good of the state, and not of the individual, is the proper subject of political thought and speculation, and we are engaged in a political discussion, while the first of these two points has a secondary interest for us, the latter will be the main subject of our inquiry. Now it is evident that the form of government is best in which every man, whoever he is, can act best and live happily. But even those who agree in thinking that the life of virtue is the most eligible raise a question, whether the life of business and politics is, or is not, more eligible than one which is wholly independent of external goods. I mean, than a contemplative life, which by some is maintained to be the only one worthy of a philosopher. For these two lives, the life of a philosopher and the life of the statesman, appear to have been preferred by those who have been the most keen in the pursuit of virtue, both in our own and in other ages. Which is the better is a question of no small moment, for the wise man, like the wise state, will necessarily regulate his life according to the best end. There are some who think that while a despotic rule over others is the greatest injustice, to exercise a constitutional rule over them, even though not unjust, is a great impediment to a man's individual well-being. Others take an opposite view. They maintain that the true life of man is the practical and political, and that every virtue admits of being practiced, quite as much by statesmen and rulers as by private individuals. Others, again, are of opinion that arbitrary and tyrannical rule alone consists with happiness, Indeed, in some states the entire aim both of the laws and of the Constitution is to give men despotic power over their neighbors. And therefore, although in most cities the law may be said generally to be in a chaotic state, still, if they aim at anything, they aim at the maintenance of power. Thus in Lacedaemon and Crete the system of education and the greater part of the laws are framed with a view to war. And in all nations which are able to gratify their ambition, military power is held in esteem, for example, among the Scythians and Persians and Thracians and Celts. In some nations there are even laws tending to stimulate the warlike virtues, 
as at Carthage, where we are told that men obtain the honor of wearing as many armlets as they have served in campaigns. There was once a law in Macedonia that he who had not killed an enemy should wear a halter, and among the Scythians no one who had not slain his man was allowed to drink out of the cup, which was handed round at a certain feast. Among the Iberians, a warlike nation, the number of enemies whom a man has slain is indicated by the number of obelisks which are fixed in the earth round his tomb, and there are numerous practices among other nations of a like kind, some of them established by law, and others by custom. Yet, to a reflecting mind, it must appear very strange that the statesman should be always considering how he can dominate and tyrannize over others, whether they will or will not. How can that which is not even lawful be the business of the statesman or the legislator? Unlawful it certainly is to rule without regard to justice, for there may be might where there is no right. The other arts and sciences offer no parallel. A physician is not expected to persuade or coerce his patients, nor a pilot the passengers in his ship. Yet most men appear to think that the art of despotic government is statesmanship, and what men affirm to be unjust and inexpedient in their own case, they are not ashamed of practicing towards others. They demand just rule for themselves, but where other men are concerned they care nothing about it. Such behavior is irrational, unless the one party is, and the other is not, born to serve, in which case men have a right to command, not, indeed, all their fellows, but only those who are intended to be subjects, just as we ought not to hunt mankind, whether for food or sacrifice, but only the animals which may be hunted for food or sacrifice, this is to say, such wild animals as are edible. And surely there may be a city, happy in isolation, which we will assume to be well governed, for it is quite possible that a city thus isolated might be well administered, and have good laws. But such a city would not be constituted with any view to war or the conquest of enemies. All that sort of thing must be excluded. Hence we see very plainly that warlike pursuits, although generally to be deemed honorable, are not the supreme end of all things, but only means. And the good lawgiver should inquire how states and races of men and communities may participate in a good life, and in the happiness which is attainable by them. His enactments will not always be the same, and where there are neighbors he will have to see what sort of studies should be practiced in relation to their several characters, or how the measures appropriate in relation to each are to be adopted. The end at which the best form of government should aim may be properly made a matter of future consideration. 3. Now let us address those who, while they agree that the life of virtue is the most eligible, differ about the manner of practicing it. For some renounce political power, and think that the life of the free man is different from the life of the statesman, and the best of all, but others think the life of the statesman best. The argument of the latter is that he who does nothing cannot do well, and that virtuous activity is identical with happiness. To both we say, you are partly right and partly wrong. First class are right in affirming that the life of the freeman is better than the life of the despot, for there is nothing grand or noble in having the use of a slave, in so far as he is a slave, or in issuing commands about necessary things. But it is an error to suppose that every sort of rule is despotic like that of a master over slaves, for there is as great a difference between the rule over freemen and the rule over slaves as there is between slavery by nature and freedom by nature, about which I have said enough at the commencement of this treatise. And it is equally a mistake to place inactivity above action, for happiness is activity, and the actions of the just and wise are the realization of much that is noble. But perhaps some one, on accepting these premises, may still maintain that supreme power is the best of all things, because the possessors of it are able to perform the greatest number of noble actions. If so, the man who is able to rule, instead of giving up anything to his neighbor, ought rather to take away his power, and the father should make no account of his son, nor the son of his father, nor friend of friend, they should not bestow a thought on one another in comparison with this higher object." 
for the best is the most eligible, and doing eligible and doing well is the best. There might be some truth in such a view if we assume that robbers and plunderers attain the chief good. But this can never be. Their hypothesis is false. For the actions of a ruler cannot really be honorable, unless he is as much superior to other men as a husband is to a wife, or a father to his children, or a master to his slaves. And therefore he who violates the law can never recover by any success, however great, what he has already lost in departing from virtue. For equals the honorable and the just consist in sharing alike, as just and equal but that the unequals should be given to equals, and the unlike to those who are like, is contrary to nature, and nothing which is contrary to nature is good. If, therefore, there is any one superior in virtue, and in the power of performing the best actions, him we ought to follow and obey, but he must have the capacity for action as well as virtue. If we are right in our view, and happiness is assumed to be virtuous activity, the active life will be the best, both for every city collectively and for individuals. Not that a life of action must necessarily have relation to others, as some persons think, nor are these ideas only to be regarded as practical which are pursued for the sake of practical results, but much more the thoughts and contemplations which are independent and complete in themselves, since virtuous activity, and therefore a certain kind of action, is an end, and even in the case of external actions, the directing mind is most truly said to act. Neither, again, is it necessary that states which are cut off from others and choose to live alone should be inactive, for activity, as well as other things, may take place by sections. There are many ways in which the sections of a state act upon one another. The same thing is equally true of every individual. If this were otherwise, God and the universe, who have no external actions over and above their own energies, would be far enough from perfection. Hence it is evident that the same life is best for each individual, and for states, and for mankind collectively. End of Book 7, Sections 1 through 3book seven sections four through nine of politics by aristotle this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org politics by aristotle translated by benjamin Jowett. book seven sections four through nine four thus far by way of introduction in what has preceded I have discussed other forms of government. In what remains, the first point to be considered, is what should be the conditions of the ideal or perfect state. For the perfect state cannot exist without a due supply of the means of life. And therefore we must presuppose many purely imaginary conditions, but nothing is impossible. There will be a certain number of citizens, a country in which to place them, and the like. As the weaver or shipbuilder or any other artisan must have the material proper for his work, and in proportion as this is better prepared, so will the result of his art be nobler, so the statesman or legislature must also have the materials suited to him. First among the materials required by the statesman is population. He will consider what should be the number and character of the citizens, and then what should be the size and character of the country. Most people think that a state, in order to be happy, ought to be large. But even if they are right, they have no idea what is a large and what a small state. For they judge the size of the city by the number of the inhabitants, whereas they ought to regard not their number, but their power. A city, too, like an individual, has a work to do, and that city which is best adapted to the fulfillment of its work is to be deemed greatest. In the same sense of the word, great, in which Hippocrates might be called greater, not as a man, but as a physician, than some one else who was taller. And even if we reckon greatness by numbers, we ought not to include everybody, for there must always be in cities a multitude of slaves and sojourners and foreigners. But we should only include those who are members of the state, and who form an essential part of it. The number of the latter is a proof of the greatness of the city, 
but a city which produces numerous artisans and comparatively few soldiers cannot be great, for a great city is not to be confounded with a populous one. Moreover, experience shows that a very populous city can rarely, if ever, be well governed, since all cities which have a reputation for good government have a limit of population. We may argue on grounds of reason, and the same result will follow. For law is order, and good law is good order, but a very great multitude cannot be orderly. To introduce order into the unlimited is the work of a divine power, of such a power as holds together the universe. Beauty is realized in number and magnitude, and the state which combines magnitude with good order must necessarily be the most beautiful. To the size of states there is a limit, as there is to other things, plants, animals, implements, for none of these retain their natural power when they are too large or too small, but they either wholly lose their nature or are spoiled. For example, a ship which is only a span long will not be a ship at all, nor a ship a quarter of a mile long. Yet there may be a ship of a certain size, either too large or too small, which will still be a ship, but bad for sailing. In a like manner a state when composed of too few is not, as a state ought to be, self-sufficing, when of too many, though self-sufficing in all mere necessities, as a nation may be, it is not a state, being almost incapable of constitutional government. For who can be the general of such a vast multitude, or who the herald, unless he have the voice of a stentor? A state, then, only begins to exist when it has attained a population sufficient for a good life in the political community, it may, indeed, if it somewhat exceeds this number, be a greater state. But as I was saying, there must be a limit. What should be the limit will be easily ascertained by experience. For both governors and governed have duties to perform, the special functions of a governor to command and to judge. But if the citizens of a state are to judge and to distribute offices according to merit, then they must know each other's characters. Where they do not possess this knowledge, both the election to offices and the decision of lawsuits will go wrong. When the population is very large, they are manifestly settled at haphazard, which clearly ought not to be. Besides, in an overpopulous state, foreigners and medics will acquire the rights of citizens, for who will find them out? Clearly, then, the best limit of the population of a state is the largest number which suffices for the purposes of life and can be taken in at a single view. Enough concerning the size of a state. 5. Much the same principle will apply to the territory of the state. Every one would agree in praising the territory which is most entirely self-sufficing, and that must be the territory which is all-producing, for to have all things and to want nothing is sufficiency. In size and extent it should be such as may enable the inhabitants to live at once temperately and liberally in the enjoyment of leisure. Whether we are right or wrong in laying down this limit, we will inquire more precisely hereafter, when we have occasion to consider what is the right use of property and wealth, a matter which is much disputed, because men are inclined to rush into one of two extremes, some into meanness, others into luxury. It is not difficult to determine the general character of the territory which is required. There are, however, some points on which military authority should be heard. It should be difficult of access to the enemy, and easy of egress to the inhabitants. Further, we require that the land, as well as the inhabitants of whom we were just now speaking, should be taken in at a single view, for a country which is easily seen can be easily protected. As to the position of the city, if we could have what we wish, it should be well situated in regard both to sea and land. This, then, is one principle, that it should be a convenient center for the protection of the whole country. The other is, that it should be suitable for receiving the fruits of the soil, and also for the bringing in of timber and any other products that are easily transported. 6. Whether a communication with the sea is beneficial to a well-ordered state or not is a question which has often been asked. It is argued that the introduction of strangers brought up under other laws, and the increase of population, will be adverse to good order. The increase arises from their using the sea and having a crowd of merchants coming and going, 
and is inimical to good government. Apart from these considerations, it would be undoubtedly better, both with a view to safety and to the provision of necessaries, that the city and territory should be connected with the sea. The defenders of a country, if they are to maintain themselves against an enemy, should be easily received both by land and by sea, and, even if they are not able to attack by sea and land at once, they will have less difficulty in doing mischief to their assailants on one element, if they themselves can use both. Moreover, it is necessary that they should import from abroad what is not found in their own country, and that they should export what they have in excess, for a city ought to be a market, not indeed for others, but for herself. Those who make themselves a market for the world only do so for the sake of revenue, and if a state ought not to desire profit of this kind, it ought not to have such an emporium. Nowadays we often see in countries and cities dockyards and harbors very conveniently placed outside the city, but not too far off, and they are kept in dependence by walls and similar fortifications. Cities thus situated manifestly reap the benefit of intercourse with their ports, and any harm which is likely to accrue may be easily guarded against by the laws, which will pronounce and determine who may hold communication with one another, and who may not. There can be no doubt that the possession of a moderate naval force is advantageous to a city. The city should be formidable not only to its own citizens, but to some of its neighbors, or, if necessary, able to assist them by sea as well as by land. The proper number or magnitude of this naval force is relative to the character of the state, for if her function is to take a leading part in politics, her naval power should be commensurate with the scale of her enterprises. The population of the state need not be much increased, since there is no necessity that the sailors should be citizens, the marines who have the control and command will be free men, and belong also to the infantry, and wherever there is a dense population of periochi and husbandmen, there will always be sailors more than enough. Of this we see instances at the present day. The city of Heraclea, for example, although small in comparison with many others, can man a considerable fleet. Such are our conclusions respecting the territory of the state, its harbors, its towns, its relations to the sea, and its maritime power. 7. Having spoken of the number of the citizens, we will proceed to speak of what should be their character. This is a subject which can be easily understood by any one who casts his eye on the more celebrated states of Hellas, and generally on the distribution of races in the habitable world. Those who live in a cold climate and in Europe are full of spirit, but wanting in intelligence and skill, and therefore they retain comparative freedom, but have no political organization, and are incapable of ruling over others. Whereas the natives of Asia are intelligent and inventive, but they are wanting in spirit, and therefore they are always in a state of subjection and slavery. But the Hellenic race, which is situated between them, is likewise intermediate in character, being high-spirited and also intelligent. Hence it continues free, and is the best governed of any nation and, if it could be formed into one state, would be able to rule the world. There are also similar differences in the different tribes of Hellas, for some of them are of a one-sided nature, and are intelligent or courageous only, while in others there is a happy combination of both qualities. And clearly those on whom the legislator will be most easily led to virtue may be expected to be both intelligent and courageous. Some say that the guardians should be friendly towards those whom they know, fierce towards those whom they do not know. Now passion is the quality of the soul which begets friendship and enables us to love. Notably, the spirit within us is more stirred against our friends and acquaintances than against those who are unknown to us, when we think that we are despised by them, for which reason Archilochus, complaining of his friends, very naturally addresses his soul in these words. For surely thou art plagued on account of friends. The power of command and the love of freedom are in all men based upon this quality, for passion is commanding and invincible. Nor is it right to say that the guardians should be fierce towards those whom they do not know, for we ought not to be out of temper with any one, 
and a lofty spirit is not fierce by nature, but only when excited against evildoers. And this, as I was saying before, is a feeling which men show most strongly towards their friends, if they think they have received a wrong at their hands, as, indeed, is reasonable, for besides the actual injury, they seem to be deprived of a benefit by those who owe them one. Hence the saying, Cruel is the strife of brethren, and again, They who love in excess also hate in excess. Thus we have nearly determined the number and character of the citizens of our state, and also the size and nature of their territory. I say nearly, for we ought not to require the same minuteness in theory as in the facts given by perception. 8. As in other natural compounds, the conditions of a composite whole are not necessarily organic parts of it. So in a state, or in any other combination forming a unity, not everything is a part, which is a necessary condition. The members of an association have necessarily some one thing the same and common to all, in which they share equally or unequally, for example, food or land or any other thing. But when there are two things of which one is a means and the other an end, they have nothing in common except that the one receives what the other produces. Such, for example, is the relation which workmen and tools stand to their work. The house and the builder have nothing in common, but the art of the builder is for the sake of the house. And so states require property, but property, even though living beings are included in it, is no part of a state. For a state is not a community of living beings only, but a community of equals, aiming at the best life possible. Now, whereas happiness is the highest good, being a realization and perfect practice of virtue, which some can attain, while others have little or none of it, the various qualities of men are clearly the reason why there are various kinds of states and many forms of government. For different men seek after happiness in different ways, and by different means, and so make for themselves different modes of life and forms of government. We must see also how many things are indispensable to the existence of a state, for what we call the parts of a state will be found among the indispensables. Let us enumerate the functions of a state, and we shall easily elicit what we want. First, there must be food. Secondly, arts, for life requires many instruments. Thirdly, there must be arms, for the members of a community have need of them, and in their own hands, too, in order to maintain authority, both against disobedient subjects and against external assailants. Fourthly, there must be a certain amount of revenue, both for internal needs and for purposes of war. Fifthly, or rather first, there must be a care of religion, which is commonly called worship. Sixthly, and most necessary of all, there must be a power of deciding what is for the public interest, and what is just in men's dealings with one another. These are the services which every state may be said to need. For a state is not a mere aggregate of persons, but a union of them sufficing for the purposes of life. And if any of these things be wanting, it is, as we maintain, impossible that the community can be absolutely self-sufficing. A state, then, should be framed with a view to the fulfillment of these functions. There must be husbandmen to procure food, and artisans, and a warlike and a wealthy class, and priests and judges to decide what is necessary and expedient. 9. Having determined these points, we have in the next place to consider whether all ought to share in every sort of occupation. Shall every man be at once husbandman, artisan, counsellor, judge, or shall we suppose the several occupations just mentioned assigned to different persons? Or thirdly, shall some employments be assigned to individuals and others common to all? The same arrangement, however, does not occur in every constitution. As we were saying, all may be shared by all, or not all by all, but only by some, and hence arise the differences of constitutions, for in democracies all share in all, in oligarchies the opposite practice prevails. Now, since we are here speaking of the best form of government, i.e., that under which the state will be the most happy, and happiness, as has been already said, cannot exist without virtue, it clearly follows that in the state which is best governed and possesses men who are just absolutely, 
and not merely relatively to the principle of the Constitution, the citizens must not lead the life of mechanics or tradesmen, for such a life is ignoble and inimical to virtue. Neither must they be husbandmen, since leisure is necessary both for the development of virtue and the performance of political duties. Again, there is in a state a class of warriors and another of counsellors who advise about the expedient and determined matters of law, and these seem in an especial manner parts of a state. Now, should these two classes be distinguished, or are both functions to be assigned to the same persons? Here again there is no difficulty in seeing that both functions will in one way belong to the same, in another to different persons. To different persons, in so far as these, i.e., the physical and the employments, are suited to different primes of life, for the one requires mental wisdom and the other strength. But on the other hand, since it is an impossible thing that those who are able to use or to resist force should be willing to remain always in subjection, from this point of view the persons are the same, for those who carry arms can always determine the fate of the Constitution. It remains, therefore, that both functions should be entrusted by the ideal constitution to the same persons, not, however, at the same time, but in the order prescribed by nature, who has given to young men strength and to older men wisdom. Such a distribution of duties would be expedient and also just, and is founded upon a principle of conformity to merit. Besides, the ruling class should not be the owners of property, for they are citizens, and the citizens of a state should be in good circumstances, whereas mechanics or any other class which is not a producer of virtue have no share in the state. This follows from our first principle, for happiness cannot exist without virtue, and a city is not to be termed happy in regard to a portion of the citizens, but in regard to them all. And clearly property should be in their hands, since the husbandmen will of necessity be slaves or barbarian periochi. Of the classes enumerated there remain only the priests, and the manner in which their office is to be regulated is obvious. No husbandman or mechanic should be appointed to it, for the gods should receive honor from the citizens only. Now, since the body of the citizen is divided into two classes, the warriors and the counselors, it is beseeming that the worship of the gods should be duly performed and also a rest provided in their service for those who from age have given up active life. To the old men of these two classes should be assigned the duties of the priesthood. We have shown what are the necessary conditions, and what the parts of a state. Husbandmen, craftsmen, and laborers of all kinds are necessary to the existence of states, but the parts of the state are the warriors and counselors, and these are distinguished severally one from another, the distinction being in some cases permanent, in others not. End of Book 7, Sections 4 through 9 Book 7, Sections 10 through 12 of Politics by Aristotle This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Politics by Aristotle Translated by Benjamin Jowett Book 7 Sections 10 through 12. 10. It is not a new or recent discovery of political philosophers that the state ought to be divided into classes, and that the warriors should be separated from the husbandmen. This system has continued in Egypt and Crete to this day, and was established, as tradition says, by a law of Sesostris in Egypt and of Minos in Crete. The institution of common tables also appears to be of ancient date being in Crete as old as the reign of Minos, and in Italy far older. The Italian historians say that there was a certain Italus, king of Anotria, from whom the Anotrians were called Italians, and who gave the name of Italy to the promontory of Europe lying within the Silenic and Lamenic gulfs, which are distant from one another only half a day's journey. They say that this Italus converted the Anotrians from shepherds into husbandmen, and besides other laws which he gave them, was the founder of their common meals. Even in our day, some who are derived from him retain this institution and certain other laws of his. On the one side of Italy, towards Tyrrhenia, dwelt the Opici, who are now, as of old, called Asonaids, 
and on the side towards Eopesia and the Ionian Gulf, in the district called Cerritus, the Chones, who are likewise of Onotrian race. From this part of the world originally came the institution of common tables, the separation into castes from Egypt, for the reign of Sesostris is of far greater antiquity than that of Minos. It is true, indeed, that these and many other things have been invented several times over in the course of ages, or rather times without number, for necessity may be supposed to have taught men the inventions which were absolutely required, and, when these were provided, it was natural that other things which would adorn and enrich life should grow up by degrees. And we may infer that in political institutions the same rule holds. Egypt witnesses to the antiquity of all these things, for the Egyptians appear to be of all people the most ancient, and they have laws and a regular constitution existing from time immemorial. We should, therefore, make the best use of what has already been discovered, and try to supply defects. I have already remarked that the land ought to belong to those who possess arms and have a share in the government, and that the husbandmen ought to be a class distinct from them, and I have determined what should be the extent and nature of the territory. Let me proceed to discuss the distribution of the land, and the character of the agricultural class, for I do not think that property ought to be common, as some maintain, but only that by friendly consent there should be a common use of it, and that no citizen should be in want of subsistence. As to common meals, there is a general agreement that a well-ordered city should have them, and we will hereafter explain what are our own reasons for taking this view. They ought, however, to be open to all the citizens. And yet it is not easy for the poor to contribute the requisite sum out of their private means, and to provide also for their household. The expense of religious worship should likewise be a public charge. The land must, therefore, be divided into two parts, one public and the other private, and each part should be subdivided, part of the public land being appropriated to the service of the gods, and the other part used to defray the cost of the common meals, while of the private land, part should be near the border, and the other near the city, so that, each citizen's having two lots, they may all of them have land in both places. There is justice and fairness in such a division, and it tends to inspire unanimity among the people in their border wars. Where there is not this arrangement, some of them are too ready to come to blows with their neighbors, while others are so cautious that they quite lose the sense of honor. Wherefore there is a law in some places which forbids those who dwell near the border to take part in public deliberations about wars with neighbors, on the ground that their interests will pervert their judgment. For the reasons already mentioned, then, the land should be divided in the manner described. The very best thing of all would be that the husbandmen should be slaves taken from among men, who are not all of the same race, and not spirited. For if they have no spirit, they will be better suited for their work, and there will be no danger of their making a revolution. The next best thing would be that they should be periochi of foreign race, and of a like inferior nature. Some of them should be the slaves of individuals, and employed in the private estates of men of property. The remainder should be the property of the state, and employed on the common land. I will hereafter explain what is the proper treatment of slaves, and why it is expedient that liberty should be always held out to them as the reward of their services. 11. We have already said that the city should be open to the land and to the sea, and to the whole country as far as possible. In respect of the place itself, our wish would be that its situation should be fortunate in four things. The first, health. This is a necessity. Cities which lie towards the east, and are blown upon by winds coming from the east, are the healthiest. Next in healthfulness are those which are sheltered from the north wind, for they have a milder winter. The side of the city should likewise be convenient both for political administration and for war. With a view to the latter, it should afford easy egress to the citizens, and at the same time be inaccessible and difficult of capture to the enemies. There should be a natural abundance of springs and fountains in the town, or, if there is a deficiency of them, great reservoirs may be established for the collection of rainwater such as will not fail when the inhabitants are cut off from the country by war. 
special care should be taken of the health of the inhabitants, which will depend chiefly on the healthiness of the locality and of the quarter to which they are exposed, and secondly on the use of pure water. This latter point is by no means a secondary consideration. For the elements which we use most and oftenest for the support of the body contribute most to the health, and among these are water and air. Wherefore, in all wise states, if there is a want of pure water, and the supply is not all equally good, the drinking water ought to be separated from that which is used for other purposes. As to strongholds, what is suitable to different forms of government varies. Thus an acropolis is suited to an oligarchy or a monarchy, but a plain to democracy, neither to an aristocracy, but rather a number of strong places. The arrangement of private houses is considered to be more agreeable and generally more convenient, if the streets are regularly laid out after the modern fashion which Hippodamus introduced, but for security in war the antiquated mode of building, which made it difficult for strangers to get out of a town and for assailants to find their way in, is preferable. A city should, therefore, adopt both plans of building. It is possible to arrange the houses irregularly as husbandmen plant their vines in what are called clumps. The whole town should not be laid out in straight lines, but only certain quarters and regions. Thus security and beauty will be combined. As to walls, those who say that cities making any pretension to military virtue should not have them, are quite out of date in their notions, and they may see the cities which prided themselves on this fancy confuted by facts. True, there is little courage shown in seeking for safety behind a rampart, when an enemy is similar in character and not much superior in number, but the superiority of the besiegers may be, and often is, too much, both for ordinary human valor and for that which is found only in a few, and if they are to be saved and to escape defeat and outrage, the strongest wall will be the truest soldierly precaution more especially now that missiles and siege engines have been brought to such perfection. To have no walls would be as foolish as to choose a site for a town in an exposed country, and to level the heights, or as if an individual were to leave his house unwalled, lest the inmates should become cowards. Nor must we forget that those who have their cities surrounded by walls may either take advantage of them or not, but cities which are unwalled have no choice. If our conclusions are just, not only should cities have walls, but care should be taken to make them ornamental, as well as useful for warlike purposes, and adapted to resist modern inventions. For, as the assailants of a city do all they can to gain an advantage, so the defenders should make use of any means of defense which have already been discovered, and should devise and invent others, for when men are well prepared, no enemy even thinks of attacking them. 12. As the walls are to be divided by guard-houses and towers built at suitable intervals, and the body of citizens must be distributed at common tables, the idea will naturally occur that we should establish some of the common tables in the guard-houses. These might be arranged, as has been suggested, while the principal common tables of the magistrates will occupy a suitable place, and there also will be the buildings appropriated to religious worship, except in the case of those rites which the law or the Pythian oracle has restricted to a special locality. The site should be a spot seen far and wide, which gives due elevation to virtue and towers over the neighborhood. Below this spot should be established an agora, such as that which the Thessalians call the Freeman's Agora. From all this trade should be excluded, and no mechanic, husbandman, or any such person allowed to enter, unless he be summoned by the magistrates. It would be a charming use of the place if the gymnastic exercises of the elder men were performed there. For in this noble practice different ages should be separated, and some of the magistrates should stay with the boys, while the grown-up men remain with the magistrates, for the presence of the magistrates is the best mode of inspiring true modesty and ingenious fear. There should also be a traitor's agora, distinct and apart from the other, in a situation which is convenient for the reception of goods both by sea and land. But in speaking of the magistrates, we must not forget another section of the citizens, viz. the priests, for whom public tables should likewise be provided in their proper place near the temples. 
the magistrates who deal with contracts, indictments, summonses, and the like, and those who have the care of the agora and of the city, respectively, ought to be established near an agora and in some public place of meeting. The neighborhood of the trader's agora will be a suitable spot. The upper agora we devote to the life of leisure, the other is intended for the necessities of trade. The same order should prevail in the country, for there, too, the magistrates, called by some inspectors of forests, and by others wardens of the country, must have guard-houses and common tables while they are on duty. Temples should also be scattered throughout the country, dedicated some to gods and some to heroes. But it would be a waste of time for us to linger over details like these. The difficulty is not in imagining, but carrying them out. We may talk about them as much as we like, but the execution of them will depend upon fortune. Wherefore, let us say no more about these matters for the present. End of Book 7, Sections 10-12 through 12. Book 7, Sections 13 and 14 of Politics by Aristotle This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Politics by Aristotle Translated by Benjamin Jowett Book 7, Sections 13 and 14 13. Returning to the Constitution itself, let us seek to determine out of what and what sort of elements the state which is to be happy and well governed should be composed. There are two things in which all well-being consists. One of them is the choice of a right end and aim of action, and the other the discovery of the actions which are meant towards it for the means and the end may agree or disagree. Sometimes the right end is set before men, but in practice they fail to attain it, and in other cases they are successful in all the means, but they propose to themselves a bad end, and sometimes they fail in both. Take, for example, the art of medicine. Physicians do not always understand the nature of health, and also the means which they use may not affect the desired end. In all arts and sciences, both the end and the means should be equally within our control. The happiness and well-being which all men manifestly desire, some have the power of attaining, but to others, from some accident or defect of nature, the attainment of them is not granted, for a good life requires a supply of external goods, in a less degree when men are in a good state, in a greater degree when they are in a lower state. Others, again, who possess the conditions of happiness, go utterly wrong from the first in the pursuit of it. But since our object is to discover the best form of government, that, namely, under which a city will be best governed, and since the city is best governed which has the greatest opportunity of obtaining happiness, it is evident that we must clearly ascertain the nature of happiness. We maintain, and have said in the ethics, if the arguments there adduced are of any value, that happiness is the realization and perfect exercise of virtue, and this is not conditional, but absolute. And I use the term conditional to express that which is indispensable, and absolute to express that which is good in itself. Take the case of just actions, just punishments and chastisements do indeed spring from a good principle, but they are good only because we cannot do without them. It would be better that neither individuals nor states should need anything of the sort, but actions which aim at honor and advantage are absolutely the best. The conditional action is the only choice of a lesser evil, whereas these are the foundation and creation of good. A good man may make the best even of poverty and disease, and the other ills of life, but he can only obtain happiness under the opposite conditions for this also has been determined in accordance with ethical arguments, that the good man is he for whom, because he is virtuous, the things that are absolutely good are good, and it is also plain that his use of these goods must be virtuous in the absolute sense of good. This makes men fancy that external goods are the cause of happiness, yet we might as well say that a brilliant performance on the lyre was to be attributed to the instrument, and not to the skill of the performer. It follows, then, from what has been said, that some things the legislature must find ready in his hand in a state, others he must provide. 
and therefore we can only say, may our state be constituted in such a manner as to be blessed with the goods of which fortune disposes, for we acknowledge her power. Whereas virtue and goodness in the state are not a matter of chance, but the result of knowledge and purpose. A city can be virtuous only when the citizens who have a share in the government are virtuous, and, in our state, all the citizens share in the government. Let us then inquire how a man becomes virtuous. For even if we could suppose the citizen body to be virtuous, without each of them being so, yet the latter would be better, for in the virtue of each the virtue of all is involved. There are three things which make men good and virtuous. These are nature, habit, rational principle. In the first place, every one must be born a man and not some other animal. So too he must have a certain character, both of body and soul. But some qualities there is no use in having at birth, for they are altered by habit, and there are some gifts which by nature are made to be turned by habit into good or bad. Animals lead, for the most part, a life of nature, though in lesser particulars some are influenced by habit as well. Man has rational principle in addition, and man only. Wherefore nature, habit, and rational principle must be in harmony with one another, for they do not always agree. Men do many things against habit and nature, if rational principle persuades them that they ought. We have already determined what natures are likely to be most easily molded by the hands of the legislator. And else is the work of education. We learn some things by habit, and some by instruction. 14. Since every political society is composed of rulers and subjects, let us consider whether the relations of one to the other should interchange or be permanent. For the education of the citizens will necessarily vary with the answer given to this question. Now, if some men excelled others in the same degree in which gods and heroes are supposed to excel mankind in general, having in the first place a great advantage even in their bodies, and secondly in their minds, so that the superiority of the governors was indisputed and patent to their subjects, it would clearly be better that once for all the one class should rule and the other serve. But since this is unattainable, and kings have no marked superiority over their subjects, such as Silax affirms to be found among the Indians, it is obviously necessary on many grounds that all the citizens alike should take their turn of governing and being governed. Equality consists in the same treatment of similar persons, and no government can stand which is not founded upon justice. For if the government must be unjust, every one in the country unites with the governed in the desire to have a revolution, and it is an impossibility that the members of the government can be so numerous as to be stronger than all their enemies put together. Yet that governors should excel their subjects is undeniable. How all this is to be effected, and in what way they will respectively share in the government, the legislator has to consider. The subject has been already mentioned. Nature herself has provided the distinction, when she made a difference between old and young within the same species, of whom she fitted the one to govern and the other to be governed. No one takes offense at being governed when he is young, nor does he think himself better than his governors, especially if he will enjoy the same privilege when he reaches the required age. We conclude that from one point of view governors and governed are identical, and from another different, and therefore their education must be the same and also different. For he who would learn to command well must, as men say, first of all learn to obey. As I observed in the first part of this treatise, there is one rule which is for the sake of the rulers, and another rule which is for the sake of the ruled. The former is a despotic, the latter a free government. Some commands differ not in the thing commanded, but in the intention with which they are imposed. Wherefore, many apparently menial offenses are an honor to the free youth by whom they are performed, for actions do not differ as honorable or dishonorable in themselves so much as in the end and intention of them. But since we say that the virtue of the citizen and ruler is the same as that of the good man, and that the same person must first be a subject and then a ruler, the legislator has to see that they became good men, and by what means this may be accomplished, and what is the end of the perfect life. 
Now, the soul of man is divided into two parts, one of which has a rational principle in itself, and the other, not having a rational principle in itself, is able to obey such a principle. And we call a man in any way good, because he has the virtues of these two parts. In which of them the end is more likely to be found, is no matter of doubt to those who adopt our division. For in the world, both of nature and of art, the inferior always exists for the sake of the better or superior, and the better or superior is that which has a rational principle. This principle, too, in our ordinary way of speaking, is divided into two kinds, for there is a practical and a speculative principle. This part, then, must evidently be similarly divided. And there must be a corresponding division of actions, the actions of the naturally better part are to be preferred by those who have it in their power to attain to two out of the three or to all, for that is always to every one the most eligible, which is the highest attainable by him. The whole of life is further divided into two parts. Business and leisure, war and peace, and of actions some aim at what is necessary and useful, and some at what is honorable and the preference given to one or the other class of actions must necessarily be like the preference given to one or the other part of the soul, and its actions over the other. There must be war for the sake of peace, business for the sake of leisure, things useful and necessary for the sake of things honorable. All these points the statesman should keep in view when he frames his laws. He should consider the parts of the soul and their functions, and above all, the better and the end. He should also remember the diversities of human lives and actions. For men must be able to engage in business and go to war. But leisure and peace are better. They must do what is necessary, and indeed what is useful, but what is honorable is better. On such principles children and persons of every age, which requires education, should be trained. Whereas even the Hellenes of the present day, who are reputed to be best governed, and the legislators who gave them their constitutions, do not appear to have framed their governments with a regard to the best end, or to have given them laws and education with a view to all the virtues, but in a vulgar spirit have fallen back on those which promise to be more useful and profitable. Many modern writers have taken in a similar view. They commend the Lacedaemonian constitution, and praise the legislator for making conquest and war his sole aim, a doctrine which may be refuted by argument, and has long ago been refuted by facts. For most men desire empire in the hope of accumulating the goods of fortune, and on this ground Thibrin and all those who have written about the Lacedaemonian constitution have praised their legislator, because the Lacedaemonians, by being trained to meet dangers, gained great power but surely they are not a happy people now that their empire has passed away, nor was their legislator right. How ridiculous is the result, if, when they are continuing in the observance of his laws, and no one interferes with them, they have lost the better part of life. These writers further err about the sort of government which the legislator should approve, for the government of free men is nobler and implies more virtue than despotic government. Neither is a city to be deemed happy, or a legislator to be praised, because he trains his citizens to conquer, and obtain dominion over their neighbors, for there is a great evil in this. On a similar principle, any citizen who could, should obviously try to obtain the power in his own state. The crime which the Lacedaemonians accuse King Pausanias of attempting, although he had so great honor already. No such principle and no law having this object is either statesmanlike or useful or right. For the same things are best both for individuals and for states, and these are the things which the legislator ought to implant in the minds of his citizens. Neither should men study war with a view to the enslavement of those who did not deserve to be enslaved. But first of all, they should provide against their own enslavement, and in the second place obtain empire for the good of the governed, and not for the sake of exercising a general despotism, and in the third place they should seek to be masters only over those who deserve to be slaves. Facts, as well as arguments, prove that the legislator should direct all his military and other measures to the provision of leisure and the establishment of peace. 
for most of these military states are safe only while they are at war, but fall when they have acquired their empire, like unused iron they lose their temper in time of peace. And for this the legislator is to blame, he never having taught them how to lead the life of peace. End of Book 7, Sections 13 and 14book 7 sections 15 through 17 of politics by aristotle this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org politics by aristotle translated by benjamin jowett book 7 sections 15 through 17 15 since the end of individuals and of states is the same the end of the best man and of the best constitution must also be the same. It is therefore evident that there ought to exist in both of them the virtues of leisure for peace, as has often been repeated, is the end of war and leisure of toil. But leisure and cultivation may be promoted, not only by those virtues which are practised in leisure, but also by some of those which are useful to business. For many necessaries of life have to be supplied before we can have leisure. Therefore, a city must be temperate and brave, and able to endure, for truly, as the proverb says, there is no leisure for slaves, and those who cannot face danger like men are the slaves of any invader. Courage and endurance are required for business and philosophy for leisure, temperance and justice for both, and more especially, in times of peace and leisure, for war compels men to be just and temperate whereas the enjoyment of good fortune and the leisure which comes with peace tend to make them insolent. Those, then, who seem to be the best off, and to be in the possession of every good, have special need of justice and temperance. For example, those, if such there be, as the poets say, who dwell in the islands of the blessed, they above all will need philosophy and temperance and justice, and all the more the more leisure they have, living in the midst of abundance." There is no difficulty in seeing why the state that would be happy and good ought to have these virtues. If it be disgraceful in men not to be able to use the goods of life, it is peculiarly disgraceful not to be able to use them in time of leisure, to show excellent qualities in action and war, and when they have peace and leisure, to be no better than slaves. Wherefore, we should not practice virtue after the manner of the Lacedaemonians, for they, while agreeing with other men in their conception of the highest goods, differ from the rest of mankind in thinking that they are to be obtained by the practice of a single virtue. And since they think these goods and the enjoyment of them greater than the enjoyment derived from the virtues, and that it should be practiced for its own sake, is evident from what has been said, we must now consider how and by what means it is to be obtained." We have already determined that nature and habit and rational principle are required, and, of these, the proper nature of the citizens has also been defined by us. But we still have to consider whether the training of early life is to be that of rational principle or habit, for these two must accord, and when in accord they will then form the best of harmonies. The rational principle may be mistaken and fail in attaining the highest ideal of life, and there may be a like evil influence of habit. This much is clear in the first place, that, as in all other things, birth implies an antecedent beginning, and that there are beginnings whose end is relative to a further end. Now, in men, rational principle and mind are the end towards which nature strives, so that the birth and moral discipline of the citizens ought to be ordered with a view to them. In the second place, as the soul and body are two, we see also that there are two parts of the soul, the rational and the irrational, and two corresponding states, reason and appetite. And as the body is prior in order of generation to the soul, so the irrational is prior to the rational. The proof is that anger and wishing and desire are implanted in children from their very birth, but reason and understanding are developed as they grow older. Wherefore the care of the body ought to precede that of the soul, and training of the appetite of part should follow, none the less our care of it must be for the sake of the reason, and our care of the body for the sake of the soul. 16. Since the legislators should begin by considering how the frames of the children 
whom he is rearing, may be as good as possible, his first care will be about marriage. At what age should his citizens marry, and who are fit to marry? In legislating on this subject he ought to consider the persons and the length of their life, that their procreative life may terminate at the same period, and that they may not differ in their bodily powers, as will be the case if the man is still able to beget children, while the woman is unable to bear them, or the woman able to bear while the man is unable to beget, for from these causes arise quarrels and differences between married persons. Secondly, he must consider the time at which the children will succeed to their parents. There ought not to be too great an interval of age, for then the parents will be too old to derive any pleasure from their affection, or to be of any use to them. Nor ought they be too nearly of an age, too youthful marriages there are many objections, the children will be wanting in respect to the parents, who will seem to be their contemporaries, and disputes will arise in the management of the household. Thirdly, and this is the point from which we digressed, the legislator must mould to his will the frames of newly born children. Almost all these objects may be secured by attention to one point. Since the time of generation is commonly limited within the age of seventy years in the case of a man, and of fifty in the case of a woman, the commencement of the union should conform to these periods. The union of male and female, when too young, is bad for the procreation of children. In all other animals the offspring of the young are small and indeveloped, and with a tendency to produce female children, and therefore also in man, as proved by the fact that in those cities in which men and women are accustomed to marry young, the people are small and weak. In childbirth, also, younger women suffer more, and more of them die. Some persons say that this was the meaning of the response once given to the Trozinans. The oracle really meant that many died because they married too young. It had nothing to do with the ingathering of the harvest. It also conduces to temperance not to marry too soon, for women who marry early are apt to be wanton, and in men, too, the bodily frame is stunted if they marry while the seed is growing, for there is a time when the growth of the seed also ceases, or continues, to but a slight extent. Women should marry when they are about eighteen years of age, and men at seven and thirty. Then they are in the prime of life, and the decline in the powers of both will coincide. Further, the children, if their birth takes place too soon, as may reasonably be accepted, will secede in the beginning of their prime, when their fathers are already in the decline of life, and have nearly reached their term of threescore years and ten. Thus much of the proper age for marriage. The season of the year should also be considered. According to our present custom, people generally limit marriage to the season of winter, and they are right. The precepts of physicians and natural philosophers about generation should also be studied by the parents themselves. The physicians give good advice about the favorable conditions of the body, and the natural philosophers about the winds, of which they prefer the north to the south. What constitution in the parent is most advantageous to the offspring is a subject which we will consider more carefully when we speak of the education of children, and we will only make a few general remarks at present. The constitution of an athlete is not suited to the life of a citizen, or to health, or to the procreation of children, any more than the valetudinarian or exhausted constitution, but one which is in a mean between them. A man's constitution should be inured to labor, but not to labor which is excessive, or of one sort only, such as is practiced by athletes. He should be capable of all the actions of a free man. These remarks apply equally to both parents. Women who are with child should be careful of themselves. They should take exercise and have a nourishing diet. The first of these precautions the legislator will easily carry into effect by requiring that they shall take a walk daily to some temple, where they can worship the gods who preside over birth. Their minds, however, unlike their bodies, they ought to keep quiet, for the offspring derive their natures from their mothers as plants do from the earth. As to the exposure and rearing of children, let there be a law that no deformed child shall live, but that on the ground of an excess in the number of children, if the established customs of the state forbid this, for in our state population has a limit. No child is to be exposed, but when couples have children in excess, let abortion be procured before sense and life have begun. What may or may not be lawfully done in these cases depends on the question of life and sensation." 
And now, having determined at what ages men and women are to begin their union, let us also determine how long they shall continue to beget and bear offspring for the state. Men who are too old, like men who are too young, produce children who are defective in body and mind. The children of a very old men are weakly. The limit, then, should be the age which is the prime of their intelligence. And this, in most persons, according to the notion of some poets who measure life by periods of seven years, is about fifty. At four or five years later, they should cease from having families, and from that time forward only cohabit with one another for the sake of health, or for some similar reason. As to adultery, let it be held disgraceful in general for any man or woman to be found in any way unfaithful when they are married, and called husband and wife. If during the time of bearing children anything of the sort occur, let the guilty person be punished with a loss of privileges in proportion to the offence. 17. After the children have been born, the manner of rearing them may be supposed to have a great effect on their bodily strength. It would appear from the example of animals, and of those nations who desire to create the military habit, that the food which has most milk in it is best suited to human beings, but the less wine the better, if they would escape diseases. Also, all the motions to which children can be subjected at their early age are very useful. But in order to preserve their tender limbs from distortion, some nations have had recourse to mechanical appliances which straighten their bodies. To accustom children to the cold from their earliest years is also an excellent practice, which greatly conduces to health, and hardens them for military service. Hence many barbarians have a custom of plunging their children at birth into a cold stream. Others, like the Celts, clothe them in a light wrapper only. For human nature should be early habituated to endure all which by habit it can be made to endure, but the process must be gradual. And children, from their natural warmth, may be easily trained to bear cold. Such care should attend them in the first stage of life. The next period lasts to the age of five. During this no demand should be made upon the child for study or labor, lest its growth be impeded, and there should be sufficient motion to prevent the limbs from being inactive. This can be secured, among other ways, by amusement, but the amusement should not be vulgar or tiring or effeminate. The directors of education, as they are termed, should be careful what tales or stories the children hear, for all such things are designed to prepare the way for the business of latter life and should be for the most part imitations of the occupations which they will hereafter pursue in earnest. Those are wrong who in their laws attempt to check the loud crying and screaming of children, for these contribute towards their growth, and in a manner exercise their bodies. Straining the voice has a strengthening effect similar to that produced by the retention of the breath in violent exertions. The directors of education should have an eye to their bringing up, and in particular should take care that they are left as little as possible with slaves. For until they are seven years old they must live at home, and therefore, even at this early age, it is to be expected that they should acquire a taint of meanness from what they hear and see. Indeed, there is nothing which the legislators should be more careful to drive away than indecency of speech, for the light utterance of shameful words leads soon to shameful actions. The young, especially, should never be allowed to repeat or hear anything of the sort. A freeman who is found saying or doing what is forbidden, if he be too young as yet to have the privilege of reclining at the public tables, should be disgraced and beaten, and an elder person degraded as his slavish conduct deserves. And since we do not allow improper language, clearly we should also banish pictures or speeches from the stage which are indecent. Let the rulers take care that there be no image or picture representing unseemly actions, except in the temples of those gods at whose festivals the law permits even ribaldry, and whom the law also permits to be worshipped by persons of mature age on behalf of themselves, their children, and their wives. But the legislator should not allow youth to be spectators of iambi, or of comedy, until they are of an age to sit at the public tables, and to drink strong wine. By that time education will have armed them against the evil influences of such representations. We have made these remarks in a cursory manner. They are enough for the present occasion, but hereafter we will return to the subject, and after a fuller discussion determine whether such liberty should or should not be granted, and in what way granted, if at all. Theodorus, the tragic actor, was quite right in saying that he would not allow any other actor, not even if he were quite second-rate, to enter before himself, 
because the spectators grew fond of the voices which they first heard. And the same principle applies universally to association with things as well as with persons, for we always like best whatever comes first. And therefore youth should be kept strangers to all that is bad, and especially to things which suggest vice or hate. When the five years have passed away, during the two following years, they must look upon the pursuits which they are hereafter to learn. There are two periods of life with reference to which education has to be divided, from seven to the age of puberty, and onwards to the age of one and twenty. The poets, who divide ages by sevens, are in the main right, but we should observe the divisions actually made by nature, for the deficiencies of nature are what art and education seek to fill up. Let us then first inquire if any regulations are to be laid down about children, and secondly, whether the care of them should be the concern of the state or of private individuals, which latter is in our own day the common custom, and in the third place, what these regulations should be. End of Book 7, Sections 15-17 through 17. Book Number 8, Sections 1-4 through 4 of Politics by Aristotle this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Politics by Aristotle, translated by Benjamin Jowett, Book Number Eight, Sections One through Four. Book Eight, Section One. No one will doubt that the legislator should direct his attention, above all, to the education of youth, for the neglect of education does harm to the Constitution. The citizen should be molded to suit the form of government under which he lives, for each government has a peculiar character which originally formed and which continues to preserve it. The character of democracy creates democracy, and the character of oligarchy creates oligarchy, and always the better the character, the better the government. Again, for the exercise of any faculty or art, a previous training and habituation are required, clearly, therefore, for the practice of virtue and since the whole city has one end, it is manifest that education should be one and the same for all, and that it should be public and not private, not as at present, when everyone looks after his own child separately, and gives them separate instruction of the sort which he thinks best the training in things which are of common interest should be the same for all. Neither must we suppose that any one of the citizens belongs to himself, for they all belong to the state, and are each of them a part of the state, and the care of each part is inseparable from the care of the whole. In this particular, as in some others, the Lacedaemonians are to be praised, for they take the greatest pains about their children, and make education the business of the state. 2. That education should be regulated by law and should be an affair of the state is not to be denied. But what should be the character of this public education, and how young persons should be educated, are questions which remain to be considered. As things are, there is a disagreement about the subjects. For mankind are by no means agreed about the things to be taught, whether we look to virtue or the best life. Neither is it clear whether education is more concerned with intellectual or with moral virtue. The existing practice is perplexing. 
No one knows on what principle we should proceed. Should the useful in life, or should the higher knowledge, be the aim of our training? All three opinions have been entertained. Again, about the means there is no agreement for different persons starting with different ideas about the nature of virtue naturally disagree about the practice of it. There can be no doubt that children should be taught those useful things which are really necessary, but not all useful things, for occupations are divided into liberal and illiberal, and to young children should be imparted only such kinds of knowledge as will be useful to them without vulgarizing them, and any occupation, art, or science which makes the body or soul or mind of the free man less fit for the practice or exercise of virtue is vulgar. Wherefore we call those arts vulgar which tend to deform the body, and likewise all paid employments, for they absorb and degrade the mind. There are also some liberal arts quite proper for a free man to acquire, but only in a certain degree, and if he attend to them too closely in order to attain perfection in them, the same evil effects will follow. The object also which a man sets before him makes a great difference. If he does or learns anything for his own sake or for the sake of his friends, or with a view to excellence, the action will not appear illiberal. But if done for the sake of others, the very same action will be thought menial and servile. The received subjects of instruction, as I have already remarked, are partly of a liberal and partly of an illiberal character. 3. The customary branches of education are in number 4. They are 1. Reading and writing. 2. Gymnastic exercises. 3. Music, to which sometimes is added. 4. Drawing. Of these reading and writing and drawing are regarded as useful for the purposes of life in a variety of ways, and gymnastic exercises are thought to infuse courage. Concerning music a doubt may be raised. In our own day most men cultivate it for the sake of pleasure, but originally it was included in education because nature herself, as has been often said, requires that we should be able not only to work well, but to use leisure well. For, as I must repeat once again, the first principle of all action is leisure. Both are required, but leisure is better than occupation and is its end and therefore the question must be asked, what ought we to do when at leisure? Clearly, we ought not to be amusing ourselves, for then amusement would be the end of life. But if this is inconceivable, and amusement is needed more amid serious occupations than at other times, for he who is hard at work has need of relaxation, and amusement gives relaxation, whereas occupation is always accompanied with exertion and effort. We should introduce amusements only at suitable times, and they should be our medicines, for the emotion they create in the soul is a relaxation, and from the pleasure we obtain rest but leisure of itself gives pleasure and happiness and enjoyment of life, which are experienced not by the busy man, but by those who have leisure. 
for he who is occupied has in view some end which he has not attained. But happiness is an end, since all men deem it to be accompanied with pleasure and not with pain. This pleasure, however, is regarded differently by different persons, and varies according to the habit of individuals. The pleasure of the best man is the best, and springs from the noblest sources. It is clear, then, that there are branches of learning and education which we must study merely with a view to leisure spent in intellectual activity, and these are not to be valued for their own sake. Whereas those kinds of knowledge which are useful in business are to be deemed necessary and exist for the sake of other things, and therefore our fathers admitted music into education, not on the ground either of its necessity or utility, for it is not necessary, nor indeed useful in the same manner as reading and writing, which are useful in money-making, in the management of a household, in the acquisition of knowledge, and in political life. Nor like drawing useful for a more correct judgment of the works of artists, nor again like gymnastics, which gives health and strength, for neither of these is to be gained from music. There remains, then, the use of music for intellectual enjoyment in leisure, which is, in fact, evidently the reason of its introduction, this being one of the ways in which it is thought that a free man should pass his leisure. As Homer says, but he who alone should be called to the pleasant feast, and afterwards he speaks of others whom he describes as inviting, the bard who would delight them all. And in another place Odysseus says, There is no better way of passing life than when men's hearts are merry, and the banqueters in the hall sitting in order hear the voice of the minstrel. It is evident, then, that there is a sort of education in which parents should train their sons, not as being useful or necessary, but because it is liberal or noble. Whether it is of one kind only, or of more than one, and if so, what they are, and how they are to be imparted, must hereafter be determined. This much we are now in a position to say that the ancients witness to us. For their opinion may be gathered from the fact that music is one of the received and traditional branches of education. Further, it is clear that children should be instructed in some useful things, for example, in reading and writing, not only for their usefulness, but also because many other sorts of knowledge are acquired through them. With a like view, they may be taught drawing, not to prevent their making mistakes in their own purchases, or in order that they may not be imposed upon in the buying or selling of articles, but perhaps rather because it makes them judges of the beauty of the human form. To be always seeking after the useful does not become free and exalted souls. Now it is clear that in education practice must be used before theory, and the body be trained before the mind, and therefore boys should be handed over to the trainer who creates in them the proper habit of body, and to the wrestling master who teaches them their exercises. 4. Of those states which in our own day seem to take the greatest care of children, 
Some aim at producing in them an athletic habit, but they only injure their forms and stunt their growth. Although the Lacedaemonians have not fallen into this mistake, yet they brutalize their children by laborious exercises which they think will make them courageous. But in truth, as we have often repeated, education should not be exclusively or principally directed to this end. And if we suppose the Lacedaemonians to be right in their end, they do not attain it. For among barbarians and among animals, courage is found associated not with the greatest ferocity, but with a gentle and lion-like temper. There are many races who are ready enough to kill and eat men, such as the Achaeans and the Henioxi, who both live about the Black Sea, and there are other mainland tribes as bad or worse, who all live by plunder, but have no courage. It is notorious that the Lacedaemonians themselves, while they alone are assiduous in their laborious drill, were superior to others, but now they are beaten both in war and gymnastic exercises. For their ancient superiority did not depend on their mode of training their youth, but only on the circumstance that they trained them when their only rivals did not. Hence we may infer that what is noble, not what is brutal, should have the first place. No wolf or wild animal will face a really noble danger. Such dangers are for the brave man. And parents who devote their children to gymnastics while they neglect their necessary education, in reality vulgarize them, for they make them useful to the art of statesmanship in one quality only, and even in this the argument proves them to be inferior to others. We should judge the Lacedaemonians not from what they have been, but from what they are. For now they have rivals who compete with their education. Formerly they had none. It is an admitted principle that gymnastic exercises should be employed in education, and that for children they should be of a lighter kind, avoiding severe diet or painful toil, lest the growth of the body be impaired. The evil of excessive training in early years is strikingly proved by the example of the Olympic victors, for not more than two or three of them have gained a prize both as boys and as men. Their early training and severe gymnastic exercises exhausted their constitutions. When boyhood is over, three years should be spent in other studies. The period of life which follows may then be devoted to hard exercise and strict diet. Men ought not to labor at the same time with their minds and with their bodies. For the two kinds of labor are opposed to one another. The labor of the body impedes the mind and the labor of the mind the body. End of Book 8, Sections 1 through 4 Recording by Robert Scott, mojomove411.com M-O-J-O-M-O-V-E 411.com August the 22nd, 2007《Book Eight, Sections Five through Seven of Politics by Aristotle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Politics by Aristotle. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book 8, Sections 5-7. through seven. Section 5. Concerning music there are some questions which we have already raised. These we may now resume and carry further, and our remarks will serve as a prelude to this or any other discussion of the subject. It is not easy to determine the nature of music, or why any one should have a knowledge of it. Shall we say, for the sake of amusement and relaxation, like sleep or drinking, which are not good in themselves, but are pleasant, and at the same time care to cease, as Euripides says? And for this end men also appoint music, and make use of all three alike, sleep, drinking, and music, to which some add dancing. Or shall we argue that music conduces to virtue, on the ground that it can form our minds and habituate us to true pleasures, as our bodies are made by gymnastics to be of a certain character? Or shall we say that it contributes to the enjoyment of leisure and mental cultivation, which is the third alternative? Now, obviously, youths are not to be instructed with a view to their amusement, for learning is no amusement, but is accompanied with pain. Neither is intellectual enjoyment suitable to boys of that age, for it is the end, and that which is imperfect cannot attain the perfect or end. But perhaps it may be said that boys learn music for the sake of the amusement, which they will have when they are grown up. If so, why should they learn themselves, and not, like the Persian and Median kings, enjoy the pleasure and instruction which is derived from hearing others? For surely persons who have made music the business and profession of their lives will be better performers than those who practice only long enough to learn. If they must learn music, on the same principle they should learn cookery, which is absurd. And even granting that music may form the character, the objection still holds. Why should we learn ourselves? Why cannot we attain true pleasure and form a correct judgment from hearing others, like the Lacedaemonians? For they, without learning music, nevertheless can correctly judge, as they say, of good and bad melodies. Or again, if music should be used to promote cheerfulness and refined intellectual enjoyment, the objection still remains. Why should we learn ourselves instead of enjoying the performance of others? We may illustrate what we are saying by our conception of the gods, for in the poet Zeus does not himself sing or play on the lyre. Nay, we call professional performers vulgar. No freeman would play or sing unless he were intoxicated or in jest. But these matters may be left for the present. The first question is whether music is or is not to be a part of education. Of the three things mentioned in our discussion, which does it produce? Education, or amusement, or intellectual enjoyment? For it may be reckoned under all three, and seems to share in the nature of all of them. Amusement is for the sake of relaxation, and relaxation is of necessity sweet, for it is the remedy of pain caused by toil, and intellectual enjoyment is universally acknowledged to contain an element, not only of the noble but of the pleasant for happiness is made up of both. All men that agree that music is one of the pleasantest things, whether with or without songs, as Musaeus says, sing to mortals of all things the sweetest. Hence, and with good reason, it is introduced into social gatherings and entertainments, because it makes the hearts of men glad, so that on this ground alone we may assume that the young ought to be trained in it. For innocent pleasures are not only in harmony with the perfect end of life, but they also provide relaxation. And whereas men rarely attain the end, but often rest by the way and amuse themselves, not only with a view to a further end, but also for the pleasure's sake, it may be well at times to let them find a refreshment in music. It sometimes happens that men make amusement the end, for the end probably contains some element of pleasure, though not any ordinary or lower pleasure, but they mistake the lower for the higher, and in seeking for the one find the other, since every pleasure has a likeness to the end of action. For the end is not eligible for the sake of any future good, nor do the pleasures which we have described exist for the sake of any future good but of the past, that is to say, they are the alleviation of past toils and pains. And we may infer this to be the reason why men seek happiness from these pleasures. But music is pursued not only as an alleviation of past toil, but also as providing recreation. And who can say whether, having this use, it may not also have a nobler one? 
in addition to this common pleasure felt and shared by all for the pleasure given by music is natural and therefore adapted to all ages and characters may not it also have some influence over the character and the soul it must have such an influence if characters are affected by it and that they are so affected is proved in many ways and not least by the power which the songs of olympus exercise for beyond question they inspire enthusiasm and enthusiasm is an emotion of the ethical part of the soul besides when men hear imitations even apart from the rhythms and tunes themselves their feelings move in sympathy since then music is a pleasure and virtue consists in rejoicing and in loving and hating aright there is clearly nothing which we are so much concerned to acquire and to cultivate as the power of forming right judgments and of taking delight in good dispositions and noble actions rhythm and melody supply imitations of anger and gentleness and also of courage and temperance and of all the qualities contrary to these and of the other qualities of character which hardly fall short of the actual affections as we know from our own experience for in listening to such strains our souls undergo a change the habit of feeling pleasure or pain at mere representations is not far removed from the same feeling about realities for example if any one delights in the sight of a statue for its beauty only it necessarily follows that the sight of the original will be pleasant to him the objects of no other sense such as taste or touch have any resemblance to moral qualities in visible objects there is only a little, for there are figures which are of a moral character, but only to a slight extent, and all do not participate in the feelings about them. Again, figures and colors are not imitations, but signs of moral habits, indications which the body gives of states of feeling. The connection of them with morals is slight, but in so far as there is any, young men should be taught to look, not at the works of Paulson, but at those of polygnotus or any other painter or sculptor who expresses moral ideas on the other hand even in mere melodies there is an imitation of character for the musical modes differ essentially from one another and those who hear them are differently affected by each some of them make men sad and grave like the so-called mixolydian others enfeeble the mind like the relaxed modes Another, again, produces a moderate and settled temper, which appears to be the peculiar effect of the Dorian. The Phrygian inspires enthusiasm. The whole subject has been well treated by philosophical writers on this branch of education, and they confirm their arguments by facts. The same principles apply to rhythm. Some have a character of rest, others of motion, and of these latter again some have a more vulgar, others a nobler movement. Enough has been said to show that music has a power of forming the character, and should therefore be introduced into the education of the young. The study is suited to the stage of youth, for young persons will not, if they can help, endure anything which is not sweetened by pleasure, and music has a natural sweetness. There seems to be in us a sort of affinity to musical modes and rhythms, which makes some philosophers say that the soul is a tuning, others that it possesses tuning. 6. And now we have to determine the question which has been already raised, whether children should be themselves taught to sing and play or not. Clearly there is a considerable difference made in the character by the actual practice of the art. It is difficult, if not impossible, for those who do not perform to be good judges of the performance of others. Besides, children should have something to do, and the rattle of Archytas which people give to their children in order to amuse them and prevent them from breaking anything in the house, was a capital invention, for a young thing cannot be quiet. The rattle is a toy suited to the infant mind, and education is a rattle or toy for children of a larger growth. We conclude, then, that they should be taught music in such a way as to become not only critics, but performers. The question, what is or is not suitable for different ages, may be easily answered nor is there any difficulty in meeting the objection of those who say that the study of music is vulgar. We reply, one, in the first place, that they who are to be judges must also be performers, and that they should begin to practice early, although when they are older they may be spared the execution. They must have learned to appreciate what is good and to delight in it, 
thanks to the knowledge which they acquired in their youth. As to two, the vulgarizing effect which music is supposed to exercise, this is a question which we shall have no difficulty in determining, when we have considered to what extent free men who are being trained to political virtue should pursue the art, what melodies and what rhythms they should be allowed to use, and what instruments should be employed in teaching them to play, for even the instrument makes a difference. The answer to the objection turns upon these distinctions, for it is quite possible that certain methods of teaching and learning music do really have a degrading effect. It is evident, then, that the learning of music ought not to impede the business of riper years, or to degrade the body, or render it unfit for civil or military training, whether for bodily exercises at the time, or for later studies. The right measure will be attained if students of music stop short of the arts, which are practiced in professional contests, and do not seek to acquire those fantastic marvels of execution, which are now the fashion in such contests, and from these have passed into education. Let the young practice even such music as we have prescribed, only until they are able to feel delight in noble melodies and rhythms, and not merely in that common part of music in which every slave or child, and even some animals, find pleasure. From these principles we may also infer what instruments should be used. The flute, or any other instrument which requires great skill, as, for example, the heart, ought not to be admitted into education, but only such as will make intelligent students of music, or of the other parts of education. Besides, the flute is not an instrument which is expressive of moral character. It is too exciting. The proper time for using it is when the performance aims not at instruction, but at the relief of passions. And there is a further objection. The impediment which the flute presents to the use of the voice detracts from its educational value. The ancients, therefore, were right in forbidding the flute to youths and freemen, although they had once allowed it. For when their wealth gave them a greater inclination to leisure, and they had loftier notions of excellence, being also elated with their success, both before and after the Persian War, with more zeal than discernment, they pursued every kind of knowledge, and so they introduced the flute into education. At Lacedaemon there was a choragus who led the chorus with a flute, and at Athens the instrument became so popular that most freemen could play upon it. The popularity is shown by the tablet which Thrasippus dedicated when he furnished the chorus to Ecphantites. Later experience enabled men to judge what was or was not really conducive to virtue, and they rejected both the flute and several other old-fashioned instruments, such as the Lydian harp, the many-stringed lyre, the heptagon, triangle, sambuca, the like, which are intended only to give pleasure to the hearer, and require extraordinary skill of hand. There is a meaning also in the myths of the ancients, which tells how Athene invented the flute and then threw it away. It was not a bad idea of theirs that the goddess disliked the instrument because it made the face ugly, but with still more reason may we say that she rejected it because the acquirement of flute-playing contributes nothing to the mind, since to Athene we ascribe both knowledge and art. Thus, then, we reject the professional instruments, and also the professional mode of education in music. And by professional we mean that which is adopted in contests, for in this the performer practices the art, not for the sake of his own improvement, but in order to give pleasure, and that of a vulgar sort, to his hearers. For this reason the execution of such music is not the part of a freeman, but of a paid performer, and the result is that the performers all vulgarized, for the end at which they aim is bad. The vulgarity of the spectator tends to lower the character of the music, and therefore of the performers. They look to him, he makes them what they are, and fashions even their bodies by the movements which he expects them to exhibit. 7. We have also to consider rhythms and modes, and their use in education. Shall we use them all, or make a distinction? And shall the same distinction be made for those who practice music with a view to education, or shall it be some other? Now we see that music is produced by melody and rhythm, and we ought to know what influence these have respectively on education, and whether we should prefer excellence in melody or excellence in rhythm. But as the subject has been very well treated by many musicians of the present day, 
and also by philosophers who have had considerable experience of musical education, to these we would refer the more exact student of the subject. We shall only speak of it now after the manner of the legislator, stating the general principles. We accept the division of melodies proposed by certain philosophers into ethical melodies, melodies of action, and passionate or inspiring melodies, each having, as they say, a mode corresponding to it. But we maintain further that music should be studied, not for the sake of one, but of many benefits, that is to say, with a view to, one, education, two, purgation, the word purgation we use at present without explanation, but when hereafter we speak of poetry, we will treat the subject with more precision. Music may also serve, three, for enjoyment, for relaxation, and for recreation after exertion. It is clear, therefore, that all the modes must be employed by us, but not all of them in the same manner. In education the most ethical modes are to be preferred, but in listening to the performances of others we may admit the modes of action and passion also. For feelings such as pity and fear, or, again, enthusiasm, exist very strongly in some souls, and have more or less influence over all. Some persons fall into a religious frenzy, whom we see as a result of the sacred melodies. When they have used the melodies that excite the soul to mystic frenzy, restored as though they had found healing and purgation. Those who are influenced by pity or fear, and every emotional nature, must have a like experience, and others in so far as each is susceptible to such emotions, and all are in a manner purged and their souls lightened and delighted. The purgative melodies likewise give an innocent pleasure to mankind. Such are the modes and the melodies in which those who perform music at the theatre should be invited to compete. But since the spectators are of two kinds, the one free and educated, and the other a vulgar crowd composed of mechanics, laborers, and the like, there ought to be contests and exhibitions instituted for the relaxation of the second class also. And the music will correspond to their minds, for as their minds are perverted from the natural state, so there are perverted modes and highly strung and unnaturally colored melodies. A man receives pleasure from what is natural to him, and therefore professional musicians may be allowed to practice this lower sort of music before an audience of a lower type. But for the purposes of education, as I have already said, those modes and melodies should be employed which are ethical, such as the Dorian, as we said before, though we may include any others which are approved by philosophers who have a musical education. The Socrates of the Republic is wrong in retaining only the Phrygian mode along with the Dorian, the more so because he rejects the flute, for the Phrygian is to the modes what the flute is to musical instruments. Both of them are exciting and emotional. Poetry proves this, for Bacchic frenzy and all similar emotions are most suitably expressed by the flute, and are better set to the Phrygian than to any other mode. The dithyram, for example, is acknowledged to be Phrygian, a fact of which the connoisseurs of music offer many proofs, saying, among other things, that Philoxenes, having attempted to compose his missions as a dithyramb in the Dorian mode, found it impossible, and fell back by the very nature of things into the more appropriate Phrygian. All men agree that the Dorian music is the gravest and manliest, and whereas we say that the extreme should be avoided and the mean followed, and whereas the Dorian is a mean between the other modes, it is evident that our youth should be taught the Dorian music. Two principles have to be kept in view. What is possible, what is becoming, at these every man ought to aim. But even these are relative to age. The old, who have lost their powers, cannot very well sing the high-strung modes, and nature herself seems to suggest that their song should be of the more relaxed kind. Wherefore the musicians likewise blame Socrates, and with justice, for rejecting the relaxed modes in education, under the idea that they are intoxicating, not in the ordinary sense of intoxication, for wine rather tends to excite men, but because they have no strength in them. And so, with a view also to the time of life when men begin to grow old, they ought to practice the gentler modes and melodies as well as the others, and further any mode such as the Lydian above all others appears to be, which is suited to children of tender age, 
and possesses the elements both of order and education. Thus it is clear that education should be based upon three principles, the mean, the possible, the becoming, these three. End of Book 8, Sections 5 through 7 Recording by Sibella Denton, Carrollton, Georgia End of Politics by Aristotle Translated by Benjamin Jowett